calling. The cloud is started. PC recording good. Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, joint with the Com Committee on Transportation. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. We also ask that you please place cell phones on silent or vibrate to minimize disruptions. If you wish to submit testimony for the record, you can do so by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Time vibrate, even vibrates bothering me. So let's turn that down. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Cohen, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Welcome to our joint virtual hearing today. I am joined by Councilmember Rodriguez, chair of the Committee on Transportation, as well as uh, Council Members Ku, Diaz, Rose, Salamanca, Chin, Jonai, Holden, and Lander and Jaeger, and Reynoso. All right. Uh, today's hearing represents an opportunity for the council to hear from the administration, the restaurant industry, and other relevant stakeholders on the implementation of the city's outdoor dining and open restaurants program, including whether any improvements or changes are needed. In early June, this committee acted swiftly to make outdoor dining a reality by hearing and passing intro uh, 1957. At this hearing, the council plans to hear legislation to extend the program to make a, perma a permanent feature of New York City's restaurant scene. Mayor de Blasio made a similar announcement to extend the program and make it permanent. This hearing is a chance to follow up on these efforts and gain more information on what the future of outdoor dining will look like in the city. New York City's restaurants struggle with very slim margin, profit margins at the best of times. With ongoing restrictions in place due to the COVID pandemic, these margins are even smaller and some restaurants have simply been unable to bear the losses. According to a report from the city controller, nearly 1300 of the city's restaurants permanently closed between March and July of this year and about 187,000 food and hospitality jobs have been lost. The city council has been proactive in doing all it can to alleviate the the pain this COVID crisis has wrought on our city's food industry. And this committee in particular has been working to pass legislation to help restaurants and food establishments stay afloat. In addition to codifying outdoor dining through the passage of intro 1957, we also enacted intro 1916, which required the city to waive and refund consent fees related to sidewalk cafe licensing for the duration of the COVID-19 emergency. The city council also passed a number of bills to limit the fees that third party delivery platforms can charge restaurants that use their services. The pieces of legislation we are hearing today are all aimed to further support the struggling industry. Intro 2096, for instance, sponsored by council member Kalos, allows DCWP to issue temporary operating licenses to restaurant owners who have acquired establishments that were previously operating sidewalk cafes but whose licenses have expired or lapsed. This bill would permit the temporary operation of these sidewalk cafes pending approval of the new application, so long as the sidewalk cafe plans are identical to the previous plans, the restaurant was required in an arm's length and the restaurant was acquired in an arm's length transaction. We are also hearing a pre-considered bill sponsored by council member Reynoso, which will make outdoor dining a permanent feature of this city. The mayor also recently announced that he plans to permit outdoor dining all year round. Such measures are pivotal if we are to make up for the significant losses restaurants have faced and will also assist toward the post COVID revival and recovery of the city. Council member Reynoso's bill also amends the fire code to allow propane gas heaters to be used in outdoor dining areas. As the winter approaches, many restaurateurs have called for updates to the city's fire code rules to allow for propane gas heaters, which are necessary to keep patrons warm and restaurants in business. Current rules prohibit propane gas heaters, despite the fact that they are permitted in numerous other cities, including San Francisco, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, DC, and Chicago. 
Unlike electric or natural gas heaters, which aren't practical for outdoor dining, propane gas heaters are portable, easy to install, and far more economical and efficient. Finally, we will also be hearing another pre-considered bill sponsored by Council Member Salamanca. Under this legislation, food establishments would no longer have to employ licensed architects or engineers to prepare plans for sidewalk cafes. The bill would allow restaurants to save on professional fees by preparing such plans themselves. Until restaurants can reopen to full capacity and until diners in the city uh, become more confident about safe, the safety of, out, of indoor dining, restaurants are unlikely to generate the revenue they produced pre-COVID. However, however, the council will continue to use all of its authority to develop creative and helpful ways to mitigate some of the fallout. Our restaurant and hospitality industries are not only key providers of jobs and revenue, but they also add to the dynamism of this great city. As such, we want to ensure we can provide whatever relief possible to this vital element of New York. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank all the staff who worked on putting this hearing together, including committee counsel, Valkis Murg, policy analyst, Leah Skrepiak, and my legislative director, Patty and Trader, and all the council staff working behind the scenes, especially our Sergeant at Arms, uh, who make this hearing possible. Uh, before we hear from the administration, I would like to invite my co-chair, Chair Rodriguez, to make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Danny Rodriguez, the chair of the Committee of Transportation. Today, the committee, jointly with the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, will conduct an oversight hearing on outdoor dining in the city open restaurant program during the COVID-19. One thing that I'm gonna say before I continue is that even though Washington DC failed to our city, the leadership of the city stand up and from the mayor, speaker, governor, commissioner, all of all being trying to be creative on how to support all the sectors that are being hurt uh, by the pandemic. Early this month, the transportation committee hold an oversight hearing titled DOT Response to COVID-19 in the Open Street Program, where the committee explores some of the issues and concerns related to open streets. I would like to thank Commissioner Trumbo and his staff for attending that hearing and providing insightful information about the city operation of the Open Street Program and the step they are taking to improve it. It is my hope that today we will build upon that initial hearing as it pertains to outdoor dining and open restaurants. We want to welcome all restaurants for having the first day today where they will be working on 25% capacity. And we know that the open street restaurant initiative where they can take advantage of the sidewalk and a space in the street, we also help them to survive this pandemic. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic had devastated our city. Sadly, the city had had more than 245,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, with almost 24,000 of those infected passing away. Everyone knows we don't want any single New Yorker to die, but most, most New Yorkers who died, they were Black, they were Latino, they're Asian, they're the poorest one. Our city is in bad financial shape with the mayor recently indicating that we have lost nearly 9 billion in revenue because of the pandemic. Our various small businesses, the backbone of our city economy have been especially hit hard as they comply with governmental orders to shut down or stop indoor dining and large gathering to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus. As a result, some of our most iconic restaurants have closed for good, while others continue to struggle to stay afloat and are barely making it. In the midst of all this turmoil, the city has had an opportunity to strategize how we purpose our city street space and sidewalks. One way we did that was by implementing the open street program that allowed New Yorkers to get our door for fresh air and to socialize with their neighbor in their community while maintaining social distance guidelines. 
the city also implemented the outdoor dining and open restaurant program. This very popular program has allowed city residents to enjoy the dining that they are accustomed to outdoors while also providing a much needed economic lifeline to this establishment. I look forward to hearing the administration testimony and working with DOT and all relevant city agencies to help make the open restaurant program a success. Thanks, Chairman Cohen, and I'll turn the hearing back to you. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, we've been joined by Council Members Yeager, Miller, Kozlowitz, and Kalos. And now I will turn it over to Council Member Joni for an opening statement as well. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my good friends, uh, Chair Cohen and Chair Rodriguez, for their leadership on this issue and conducting this very important hearing. These multi uh, committee hearings are not easy, and I want to thank you for your generosity in allowing me to have an opening statement. Like many businesses forced to cope with the devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic, our city's 27,000 strong restaurant industry is in desperate need of a lifeline before it's too late. And it is with a truly heavy heart that I now say for many of them, it may already be too late. A recent study featured in the recent, a recent, recent study featured in a recent New York Times article suggested that upwards of 70% of locally owned restaurants may not survive this public health crisis. Those fortunate enough to be in a position to possibly rebuild are looking toward the city to provide the leadership, guidance, and regulatory reforms needed to give them a fighting chance. Earlier this year, when restaurants had to almost exclusively depend on delivery and takeout to survive, the Small Business Committee took up and passed a package of legislation to reform the business dealing sky high commissions and fees structure charged to restaurants by food delivery apps. This action by the committee and my council colleagues undoubtedly save business and the jobs that they provide. Or should I say that we are now at a position to help this industry survive so that they can thrive much later. Now, as we enter this new stage of reopening our economy, we must deliberate and put in place the right structure to help restaurants keep their doors open while doing everything possible to keep New Yorkers safe. Along with reducing the regulatory burdens and reducing fees and fines, allowing New York City restaurants to have indoor capacity consistent with the rest of the state, allowing restaurants to have some form of outdoor dining is one of the most important things that the city officials can do. This is why I applaud the announcement last week to chart a path that will allow this to happen. Today, I look forward to hearing from the administration on their plans to successfully implement permanent outdoor restaurant dining and how we plan to make this painless as possible for restaurants dependent on the program succeeding. This includes avoiding the debacles of the summer when we had implemented open streets and open dining and had barricade requirements changed after these restaurants that were losing money have to go back and rebuild the barricades that were originally approved. This also includes removing all fees, and I'm relying on both the chairs to help navigate through this. All fees and all permits, including the fire department fee for propane tanks. But I'm just as interested as hearing from the restaurant owners and industry stakeholders on the needs and concerns that they may have in implementing the program so that the law and the policymakers can address their needs and can formalize the program and the corresponding legislation in advance so that they don't needlessly spend more money and limited resources 
for this opportunity. I want to thank my colleagues, Council Member Salamanca and Carlos, for drafting these critical and timely pieces of legislation. And as chair of Small Business Committee, I look forward to working with them and members of both the Consumer Affairs and Transportation Committee to ensure that we get this right and in advance, a workable outdoor dining solution for restaurants that are desperate to find a workable path forward. And chairs, I just want to give out some acknowledgement to, um, I see Robert Bookman is on here. Uh, and I believe, is your colleague on here as well, Robert? Um, I want to thank you for your continued dialogue and bringing to my attention the issues of this industry. We're going to get through this together. And we're going to make sure that we shape the future so that we can all survive. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Joni. I'll now ask Councilmember Kalos to make an opening statement uh, regarding Intro 2096. Good afternoon, and thank you to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Chair Andy Cohen and Committee on Transportation Chair Donis Rodriguez for leading this hearing on making outdoor dining permanent and making it easier to get sidewalk cafe licenses. We've had a blight of empty storefronts before the pandemic and the closure of indoor dining has only made things worse as restaurants were forced to subsist on revenue from takeout alone. I, I was proud to join Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Council Member Keith Powers and countless others in Manhattan uh, as we advocated for an opening of outdoor dining uh, ahead of the Memorial Day weekend. We didn't quite hit that deadline, but I do want to thank Mayor de Blasio, DOT, uh, and, and uh, Consumer Affairs for working with us to, to get that program up and off the ground. As an elected official, I will tell you, anytime we've touched a single parking spot in our city, we've usually had a uh, pitched battle on our hands, but something uh, miraculous happened in that we were able to create this outdoor dining program without a uh, huge pushback, uh, perhaps because many of the car owners uh, were, were not there to really fight back on it. But either way, uh, I've watched our communities be transformed, our streets activated, um, and it's just been beautiful. And, and at least for my part and from my district, a, a welcome addition to our city. I'm proud to be a uh, co-sponsor of a uh, pre-considered uh, introduction on this. Uh, and uh, I guess the, the other piece I also wanted to talk about is um, one of the best parts of my job is just the opportunity to meet with residents. And so we do First Friday, we welcome people into the office, but we also rely on organizations like the New York Hospitality Alliance led by Andrew Ridgey, uh, who create opportunities to put elected officials and business owners in the same place. And uh, it was not too long ago, it was in February uh, at a rooftop event where uh, a restaurant owner was just talking to me about the fact that when they pick up a restaurant or when they're doing the whole application process uh, to get a sidewalk cafe, it, it is incredibly bureaucratic, filled with incredible amounts of red tape. And so we worked closely with the Hospitality Alliance, this restaurant owner and uh, their attorney, Robert Bookman, on legislation. And just to say, like right now, the sidewalk cafe process has been suspended during the pandemic. But the idea is as we head back out of it and, and, and hopefully get through it and, and get back to return to normalcy, uh, just to put it in perspective, there's about 1,416 licensed sidewalk cafes in New York City, but 1,004 of them are actually here in Manhattan. And so the sidewalk cafe process on average uh, in 2017, according to Consumer Affairs, actually took 467 days. And that's just not time we have when, when businesses are, are fighting for their lives. And uh, we, we can, we, sorry, it's 467 days for an enclosed sidewalk cafe, 177 for an unenclosed. Uh, and so there, there are huge variances in this. And so what introduction 2096 puts forward, and again, I, I wish I could claim credit for this. I wish it was my idea. Uh, the best thing I can do is just lend my office to those who really know what they're talking about, which is the restaurant owners, the New York Hospitality Alliance, is to just say that when you take over a business, and, and listen, we've had a blight of these empty storefronts, and we need people to come in. When you take over a business that previously had a sidewalk cafe, that you can use that exact same sidewalk cafe with a temporary permit, uh, that if you previously had one in the past three years, that you'll be able to 
I get it back without having to go through all the pop and circumstance. And so I'm just hoping that with the support of uh, the city from DOT consumer affairs of our committee chairs of our speaker and all the members here that we can just cut some of that red tape, get rid of some bureaucracy and make it a lot easier for businesses uh, to, to stay here in our city and keep those jobs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Kalos. I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Deutsch, Powers, Brannon, and Cabrera. Uh, and now I will ask Council Member Reynoso to make a, an opening statement regarding uh, his proposed legislation. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the lighting in the house is a problem. <laughs> I'll be quick. I want to just say thank you to the chairs and Thank you to all of our small businesses, our restaurants and bars and lounges um, for just uh, hanging in there uh, as long as possible, considering the lack of support that they've received um, from the federal government and in some cases, the state government. I do wanna um, note that what I'm asking for uh, our city agencies to do is to be very relaxed with how we enforce anything that is being proposed here today and has been proposed in the past when it comes to restaurants. We want to make sure that we're in a, a position where we're allowing for restaurants and, and these locations to be able to rectify whatever issues they have free of fines and summonses. Um, if there is a problem, tell them what it is and give them an opportunity um, to cure any issues. Um, uh, I recently was out with uh, restaurant owners that said their biggest issue is actually the state liquor authority, not any agency from the city, and that the state liquor authority is um, heavy handed, uh, overzealous, and making it very difficult for them uh, to, uh, to, to move around or to do work um, that can, uh, again, save their livelihoods. I'll give an example and then, uh, and then I'll move on. Uh, the, the city of New York allows for businesses or restaurants to use adjacent properties um, with permission of those owners um, to use that space uh, to expand their outdoor dining experience. Uh, the State Liquor Authority does not allow for you to serve alcohol in those extended spaces or those adjacent spaces. And if you do that, you lose your license. Um, and if that's not um, uh, an, an overhand or aggressive move by the State Liquor Authority and by the state um, in sending a very clear messages to small businesses that they're not being supported, um, I don't know what is. Uh, so again, this outdoor dining has been a, a huge success um, and it's something that I'm looking forward to expanding permanently. I'm very happy that we're going to be able to do this permanently. And I'll tell all of the folks that are not necessarily street advocates outside of cars and vehicles uh, to look at what happened because of a crisis. Imagine what we could do if we could do these type of things um, before a crisis. Uh, vehicles are not the most ideal uh, 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 operator or user for our streetscape. People are. And when we put people first, this is how we can re reinvent New York City. So I hope that I can get more support from council members on other issues that I think are extremely important when it comes to street space. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. I'm looking forward to this hearing and making outdoor dining permanent. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member Reynoso. And now I will hand it over to Council Member Salamanca uh, to make a statement regarding his legislation. Thank you, uh, Chair Cohen and Chair Rodriguez for allowing me to speak on my bill today, uh, pre-considered intro uh, 6677. Um, when we look back at 2020, New Yorkers will recall the unprecedented nature in which our day-to-day -day lives were radically altered by COVID-19 illness. Uh, from the way we work to the way our children get an education to even the way we carry out our legislative process, Americans have fully grasped the remote lifestyle. This shift to a technology-driven society also highlighted the nature of the double-edged sword uh, COVID was. Instantly, mom and pop shops, restaurants, and industries that relied on in-person interaction suffered, in return, threatening the local economics that have propped up cities around the world. As we managed to get the upper hand on containing the spread of the virus and look for ways to revitalize our economy, we as a city have been prompted to review the rules and regulations in place that have been burdensome on our businesses community. One issue that has been raised time and time again within the restaurant industry is the requirement that a licensed architect or engineer draw up and sign off on seating plans for a sidewalk cafe permit. 
although there are a range of programming that enables restaurants to produce their own plans, city regulations require third party oversight that not only prolong the process of submitting an application, but added significant overhead costs. Even in the past, even in the best of times, this requirement was the difference for some smaller restaurants in deciding whether to move forward with the sidewalk cafe permit application. Removing this requirement will be a welcome change that will benefit restaurant owners from Southern Boulevard in the South Bronx to Nostrum Avenue in Brooklyn and beyond. Given the current climate, we have a responsibility to ensure that our actions and legislators spur on our economy, not hamper it. Measures like these bills we are hearing today are an important first step in providing a much needed lifeline to our small businesses. And I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues in business improvement districts alike on creating a more friendlier business environment. Thank you, Chair Cohen and Rodriguez uh, for holding this important hearing. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, I will now uh, turn the committee over to council to address some procedural items and administer the oath to the administration. Thank you. I'm Balkis Mary, Council to the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I'll be periodically announcing who the panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be representing the administration. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in that order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of question for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call on representatives, representatives of the administration to testify. First, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg from the Department of Transportation, followed by Commissioner Laura Lee Salas from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. And joining us for questions from DOT are Assistant Commissioner Rebecca Zach and Deputy Commissioner Eric Beaton. From DCWP, we have Executive Director Stephen Etanani. And from FDNY, we have Assistant Chief Joseph Jardin. And finally, we have Executive Director Stephen Picker from the Department of Small Business. Before we begin, I'll administer the oath. Commissioner Trottenberg, Commissioner Salas, Assistant Commissioner Zach, Deputy Commissioner Eric Beaton, Director Etanani, Assistant Chief Jardin, and Director Picker, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, before these committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Trottenberg. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Salas? Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Zach? Yes. yes. Deputy Commissioner Beaton? Yes. Director Etnani? Yes. Assistant Chief Jardin? Yes. Director Picker? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Trottenberg, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez, Chairman Cohen, members of the Transportation and Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committees. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, joined by my agency administration colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on the city's open restaurants program, as well as pre-considered intro by Councilmember Reynoso, and our colleagues from DCWP will testify in intro 2096 and the other pre-considered introduction. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, the administration and all of us at DOT are very proud of the work we've done during the COVID-19 pandemic here in New York to transform our streets to promote safe recreation, sustainable transportation, 
and of course our beloved restaurant industry. As I testified earlier this month in depth, this administration has implemented over 75 miles of open streets citywide, nearly 50% of which are in zip codes with the highest rates of COVID in the city, mostly communities of color, and nearly 60% are in census tracts that are low to moderate income. We're also on target to build more bike and bus lanes this year than ever before, and to continue expanding city bike into upper Manhattan and the South Bronx, even as we've had to grapple with severe workforce and budgetary challenges due to COVID-19. But there's no question that our open restaurants program done in partnership with you here on the council and with the industry has been one of our most far reaching and successful initiatives. And we think the largest such program in the world. To date, over 10,400 restaurants have applied to participate in the program, supporting an estimated 100,000 jobs for a diverse group of workers throughout the five boroughs. The program now also boasts 85 open streets open restaurants, sites where local restaurants are able to close the street off to vehicular traffic. The results have been inspiring. Restaurants all over the city have created beautiful, welcoming outdoor spaces. And I know we've all seen New Yorkers in so many neighborhoods dining out or just enjoying the festive closed streets to picnic, play music, and watch their kids run around. And the restaurants have helped the city's economy and tax base while bringing a sense of hope and vibrancy back to our streets. So we're pleased to be here today to also amplify the mayor's announcement last week that the open restaurants program will be extended year round and expanded even further. And the city will take the steps working with you on the council and our industry partners to make the program permanent. For the first time, the city will allow electric gas and propane heaters to facilitate outdoor dining at restaurants during the colder months under FDNY and Department of Buildings oversight, and will provide guidance on the use of tent enclosures. And we're working with the restaurant industry on additional safety features for roadside barriers with the winter months in mind to be announced very soon. In another significant expansion, we will also allow restaurants to create seating in an adjacent roadway space and in the sidewalk frontage as long as the owners of adjacent properties are willing to cooperate. This will open the program to thousands of additional restaurants. The city will also work with the state liquor authority on any necessary requirements. And in early October, DOT will release a template agreement for restaurants that wish to use adjacent space. As we now turn to the legislation before us today on codifying the open restaurants program permanently, let me share some of the city's lessons learned to date. There's no question that facing the devastating economic effects of COVID-19, the city stepped out of its comfort zone and faced a steep learning curve in standing up a program of such scope and magnitude in a matter of weeks. We saw 1,800 applications on the first day, over 5,000 the first week, over 8,000 within the first month, and are now over 10,400, as I mentioned earlier. We're proud of DOT's nimble self-certification process that made it possible for restaurants to begin serving customers outdoors right away. But we do want the council to understand that the program did require a lot of resources from a number of city agencies overseen by City Hall. We collectively stood up a robust real-time data system to monitor progress and compliance, devised educational materials, including detailed programs and a how-to video for roadway setups, and established teams to handle thousands of telephone and email communications with applicants to help restaurants create safe curb lane setups and follow appropriate health guidelines. DOT also created a popular public facing portal with the most up to date information and a map of participating restaurants. The city rapidly deployed hundreds of staff from DOT and other city agencies for education, mediation, inspections and enforcement as we help restaurants create safe roadway setups. And I can honestly say that breaking down those agency silos and tackling this interdisciplinary work collaboratively has been an inspiration for all of us in the administration. We think exemplifying the best in city government. Now, as we turn to making the popular open restaurants program, which was created under an emergency mayoral executive order, a permanent part of our city, we look forward to discussing with the council the longer term operational, fiscal and legal issues to be resolved. The first issue is the city's ultimate legal control of the public right of way. The city has an inalienable right to the streets, and therefore we will need to consider the nature of any consent that we would grant restaurant operators, which could effectively motivate storefront owners to consider that the value of their commercial leasehold interest has been enhanced. This is a critical issue, which has the potential to affect the use of our streets, agency operations, and budgets for generations to come. I urge careful consideration, balancing all the other ever-changing needs for the curb. DOT's core mission remains moving people and goods through the city safely, efficiently, and in an environmentally sustainable manner. 
as we make the open restaurants program permanent, we must also prioritize public transportation and safety infrastructure, including bike lanes and bus lanes, while also leaving room for future innovations. This is particularly true because the geographic distribution of open restaurants closely overlaps with some of the city's highest demand curbs and its busiest streets. Our streets are used by many entities, public and private. DOT is regular resurfacing and restriping, as well as installing and maintaining traffic in infrastructure. DSNY is sweeping and removing snow. DEP is maintaining water and sewer infrastructure. New York City Transit is maintaining subway infrastructure. And private utilities are running pipes, conduits, and wiring. Long term, all these necessary functions must be integrated into a permanent roadway restaurant program. In addition to working through these questions, we also need to determine how this new outdoor dining program will fit with the existing sidewalk cafe program. And we look forward to discussing that with the council and our sister agencies. There's also the issue of what zoning text amendments might be needed to make this program permanently. We will obviously look for the council's partnership in that process. Finally, the mayor's executive order states that open restaurants shall adhere to all local, state, and federal requirements relating to accessibility for people with disabilities, including path of travel, minimum table heights, and clearance requirements. And it will be important to ensure that setups under a permanent program meet these standards as well. In closing, the administration and DOT remain immensely proud that open restaurants has been embraced by diverse neighborhoods citywide, from Mott Haven in the Bronx, Washington Heights in Manhattan, Jackson Heights in Queens, Sunset Park in Brooklyn, Tompkinsville in Staten Island, and dozens more. I want to express my profound gratitude to the entire hardworking team at DOT from every corner of our agency, many of whom work nonstop seven days a week, giving up holidays and precious family time to make this program such a success. I also wish to thank our sister agencies, especially SBS, MOM, and the Office of Nightlife, as well as the mayor and deputy mayor, Laura Anglin, for their support. Finally, I want to thank Council Member Reynoso, the committee chairs who are presiding today, and the whole council for championing open restaurants. The administration looks forward to a fruitful discussion on the legislation before us today, and I'll be happy to answer questions after you hear from Commissioner South. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Before the commissioner uh, testifies, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Menchaca and Levin. Thank you. Commissioner Salas, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairs Cohen and Rodriguez and members of the committees. I am Lorelei Salas, Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, also known as DCWP. I am joined today by my colleague, Steve Etanani, who is the Executive Director for External Affairs. I would like to thank the committees for the opportunity to testify today on Introduction 2096, relating to temporary operating letters for sidewalk ca cafe license applicants and preconsidered introduction 6677 relating to sidewalk cafe plan drawings. Before I discuss the bills before the committees today, I would also like to take a moment to take the, uh, thank the council for its close partnership with the department over the past few months to ensure that we have been able to continue serving our city's consumers and workers. In working with Chair Cohen and other members here today, we've tackled many important issues confronting the city during extremely difficult times. I apologize if you can hear my cat in the background. <laughs> Sidewalk Cafe licensing. Um, DCWP licenses 106 enclosed and 1,195 unenclosed sidewalk cafes. Applicants for a sidewalk cafe license are limited to only certain locations of the city pursuant to the city's zoning re resolution. And subsequently, close to 70% of all sidewalk cafe licensees are in Manhattan. Approving sidewalk cafe license applications is a detailed and lengthy process required by the administrative code, which includes reviews by DCWP, and the Department of City Planning in instances where the application is for an enclosed cafe, the local community board, the city council, as well as approval from the mayor's office of contract services, and finally registration of the revocable consent agreements with the controller. This process can take four to five months, even if an applicant has submitted their application correctly. Pursuant to the mayor's executive order 126, the sidewalk cafe licensing program was suspended on June 18th as the city began administering open restaurants. Pursuant to this EO, 
the CWP is not accepting or processing new or renewal sidewalk cafe applications. In early April, the mayor suspended all sidewalk cafe consent fees under EO 105. Subsequently, local law 54 of this year, sponsored by Chair Cohen, refunded this year's consent fees to licensees. Before I turn to the specifics of the legislation at hand, I should say that there's an incredible opportunity right now to holistically rethink the concept of outdoor dining in New York City. DCWP believes that any future for the sidewalk cafe licensing program should be informed by the successes of the open restaurants program operated by my colleagues at the Department of Transportation under the incredible leadership of Commissioner Trottenberg. This plan has served more than uh, 10,000 businesses, eight times the size of the sidewalk cafe licensing program across the city. While DCWP agrees with the intent of introduction 2096 and preconsider 6677 to make the sidewalk cafe licensing processes less burdensome and prescriptive for businesses, these amendments will fall short of these goals if pursued in a vacuum. Instead, Council should consider a comp comprehensive reevaluation of the sidewalk cafe process in totality. Moving on to today's legislation, Introduction 2096 would allow applicants of enclosed and unenclosed sidewalk cafes to be issued temporary operating letters, also known as TOLs, pending approval of the applicant's revocable consent agreements. We are continuing to review the bill language and hope to work with the council to ensure a final version accomplishes the goals of this bill, simplifying the requirements restaurants must meet to successfully operate in New York City, without causing any undue delays. The preconsidered introduction would allow sidewalk cafe applicants to submit planned drawings without the requirements that the drawings be prepared by an architect, engineer, or otherwise third-party professional. In our experience, the plan review process is burdensome and expensive for applicants and difficult for agency staff who do not have engineering or architectural backgrounds. We believe this legislation could be served by moving away from the current framework and instead enshrining a less prescriptive process for businesses that ensures compliance with applicable safety and accessibility laws. Since the council's last hearing on this topic in June, open restaurants has become a popular fixture of our city's streetscape with calls for it to be made permanent. We believe that the future of the sidewalk cafe process needs to take open restaurants into account and its successful implementation, such as by contemplating a singular program with the goal to continue supporting our city's restaurants as fairly as possible. Once again, thank you, Chairs Cohen, Rodriguez, and members of the committees for the opportunity to testify today, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Salas. I'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen, followed by Chair Rodriguez. Panelists, please stay unmu unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council and chairs would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for your testimony and your taking the time to testify today. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to be brief and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, I guess what I'm a little uh, concerned about, or I want to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity. I'm getting feedback. I don't, someone's on mute. Thank you. Um, uh, to sort of taking a, a holistic uh, view of what we're, you know, what we're trying to do here. Um, uh, in terms of trying to make uh, support the restaurant industry in New York uh, and develop uh, and keep outdoor dining or, or, or come up with some way to keep uh, support the restaurant industry. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the interagency process that's going on uh, within the administration to try to develop plans that uh, meet the goals of DOT, uh, obviously uh, consumer affairs, uh, but all the other state agencies, you know, Department of Health, I don't know how, you know, is are they involved in terms of uh, what uh, what safe uh, 
outdoor dining looks like in the winter. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the process? Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to start us off here, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and my colleagues may want to jump in. I, I think, as I said in my testimony, um, this was a tremendous sort of interagency learning curve. And we really broke down a lot of silos. People sort of talk about that cliche in government of breaking down the silos. We really did it for this program. And a lot of agencies, we don't even always work together all that often. Um, you know, DOT wasn't actually in the restaurant business uh, b before a few months ago. And I think it has been a tremendous partnership with, with the agencies who are here today, as well as you know, Department of Health, SBS, Office of Nightlife, and a lot of input from City Hall and, and all the expertise there. It really was an all hands on deck effort. And we certainly learned as we went along. I, I you know, certainly will admit we had some bumps in the beginning of the program, I think as you would understand in a program that started so rapidly and at such a, a quick pace. We have certainly been discussing amongst ourselves, I, I hear you, Mr. Chairman, what a sort of unified holistic program is going to look like. I think we obviously very much want to explore that with you on the council because I think as a, from our earliest discussions, part of what has made this program successful is we have cut a lot of that red tape and, and truncated a lot of the sort of community processes and things that are enshrined in our zoning, our zoning overlays, our ad code, et cetera. You know, I think we want to work closely with you to decide how we prune that back and make something that works for the industry, an industry we all we all care about and, and want to do everything we can to help, while preserving obviously whatever we think we need to keep enshrined that keeps the program safe, that that makes sure that it's accessible, that you know, that the city's ability to to do its own operations on the street are, are also maintained. And again, I think we're looking very much for partnership with you all on that. Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I guess I, I'm just you know, the idea that the that you know the mayor is using the word permanent, um, I, I, I feel like we're a long ways away from getting uh, to a, an idea of how we're going to re envision our streets uh, in such a dramatic fashion. Uh, you know that we're calling permanent, and when I I feel, just feel we're a long ways away from that. And you know, you mentioned in your in your testimony about you know the, the goals and the and the mission of DOT and. You know, as I think about, uh, you know, that we have, you know, pedestrians obviously using our streets. Uh, we have cyclists using our streets. We now, you know, for good or for bad, we have a flood of, uh, you know, personal e-transportation on our streets. We have trucks on our streets. We have buses on our streets. There, there are so many users competing for such limited space. Um, I just want to make sure that we're doing it smartly and again in, in sort of a, a unified holistic approach as, as Commissioner Lasalle said. So I'm just concerned about that. I'm going to turn it, uh, and let, you can respond if you want to, but I'm, otherwise I'm going to turn it over to Chair Rodriguez and I'll come back as... I, I, I will just say quickly, wholeheartedly agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think the pandemic enabled us obviously to move nimbly in a way that I definitely, and I hear it from you all, uh, uh, on the council, and I've certainly heard it from fellow New Yorkers, it, it did enable us to take a big leap in re-envisioning our streets, you know, particularly as, as council member Reynosa was saying, as a much less sort of auto-centric system. And I, I think we do want to build on that. Um, but you are right to mention all the other things we are trying to accommodate on our streets, bike lanes, bus lanes, e-scooters, taxis, and FHVs, trucks, et cetera. Um, you know, we will work closely with you. That is sort of d and stock and trade is trying to constantly negotiate that balance. And obviously there's not a one size fits all recipe. I'm sure all of you here today would, would probably agree with me on that. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Rodriguez and I'll come back, thanks. Thank, thank you, Chair. As I said before, I feel that, you know, the city of New York has a lot to continue learning from this health crisis that we've been hit and back in February. And I think that the fact that we are the city that last year received 65 million tourists, a city where we have more than 30% of New York living in poverty, you know, put ourselves in a place to be hit so hard by the pandemic. And I think that the leadership, that in different way we've been showing and and working around, as I say, from the mayor to the speaker to commissioners and everyone, is a, should be a role model for all the municipality through the whole nation, even though that guy in DC, uh, because of his own agenda, tried to put us all in a different place. 
when it comes to uh, you know thing that definitely we had to learn from and and continue doing better uh, is the one that we are discussing today with the open street restaurant. Uh, I believe that this is again a, a program that came to a stay. I know that DOT will continue playing a major role together with the other sister agency from a small business, consuming a fear, health and fire department. But one of my, uh, my question is on uh, how is DOT taking the necessary measure to deal with reckless driver and the safety that should be put in, the safety tools that should be in place in the restaurant so that, you know, we don't open those restaurants to be criticized in the future if some crashes continue happening in the surrounding area. Um, I'll take a crack at that. And I think, you know, one thing, again, on the steep learning curve of this program and, and council member Joe and I alluded to it, it's true when we started this program, we put in a set of requirements and we found they were not that easy for restaurants to follow. And we determined sort of looking at the setups that they needed to be made stronger. And we certainly regret that it, it proved inconvenient for restaurants, um, was certainly not our intention. But I think, you know, your, your question, Mr. Chairman, gets at why we did it. We wanna make sure that these setups in the streets are safe. And in addition to coming up with some tighter requirements, I think a lot of you know, we created a whole infrastructure to try and help restaurants. We have our inspectors on it again, DOT is not fining. We haven't issued any fines, but we've had inspectors that we've had now over 21,000 visits where they've gone and worked with restaurants to help them create safe setups. DOT, we've created an online video working with small business services. We have phone hotlines, email lines where restaurants can come to get guidance. At DOT, we've also put forward a public education campaign to encourage motorists to drive safely around restaurant setups. And we're gonna to continue to, to strengthen that safety element of the program. It is certainly, I'd say, the administration's highest priority. Do you think that at some point, uh, the city should explore uh, to also work with the restaurant owners uh, with city subsidy in different way to bring pedestrian bowlers close to those restaurants where we have heavy traffic uh, in the surrounding area restaurant? I mean, I, I certainly think as, as the mayor announced last week, we are ready to consider as this, you know, remember this, this program when it started in the street was only gonna last through Labor Day. And then the mayor extended it to the end of October and is now extending it indefinitely. And we think in the winter months as these setups in the street, they're gonna get more wear and tear. There may be snow, there may be snow plows. We're gonna to wanna to find ways to make them stronger, Mr. Chairman, we're talking to the industry about that. And certainly we'll be happy to engage with you all. We wanna we want to find that sweet spot of making these setups as safe as we can on the street, but, but doing it with the industry uh, in a way that's feasible for the city and the industry. I, I don't know whether I can commit to the city being able to do a, a big subsidization, but, but we're certainly open to having those dialogues. Okay. And my last question is on to the fire department. And I know that City Hall still was working to put together a, the whole process on how a restaurant owner will be able to get the permit. Sorry, there's some sound, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I live talking to some local restaurants and one of the uh, things that they told me was that when they were trying to start getting a answer to the question on how the the whole process to get permit to put the gas in the sidewalk that there was, and again, I know that city hall been trying to work it out with you guys, but there was no answer. I don't think that agency was ready yet to talk about how, what is the process? What is the, how the fire department will be working the restaurant owner? Because if, you know, if we are looking to be more flexible, we know that the safety is important, but also the requirement has to be completely different. So what should we expect to, uh, for the restaurant owner to deal with when they start uh, requesting permit to install gas in the sidewalk? So it's my understanding, uh, 
uh, council member that later today, City Hall will be publishing guidance for uh, this, um, you know, this change to the outdoor dining to, uh, among other things, uh, provide for mechanisms to heat uh, the outdoor seating areas. And it'll offer uh, several options of heating, electric heaters, uh, pipe natural gas heaters, as well as uh, propane heaters. Um, the fire department will be primarily concerned with the uh, permitting of and the oversight of the propane heating option, uh, electric heaters and uh, the pipe natural gas. The administrative um, portion is uh, a Department of Buildings responsibility, uh, although we'll be involved uh, in the inspection of the pipe natural gas alternative. However, uh, we will, uh, following the uh, publication of that guidance by City Hall, hopefully later on today, we will have um, in short order uh, hopefully a one-stop shop where uh, these business owners can uh, connect to find out what exactly they need to do to um, to safely uh, manage the use of propane gas if they qualify based on uh, the parameters that will be provided in terms of uh, the use of that alternative. Uh, I think we're going to make it somewhat user-friendly. So if uh, after reading the uh, requirements for the use of gas, the safe use of propane gas, uh, the uh, restaurant owner thinks that he or she uh, meets uh, those provisions that they'll be able to start uh, at the same time they submit uh, an attestation reflecting that they understand what the risks are associated with the use of that um, that product, which are significant. Uh, as you know, uh, that uh, propane is currently not allowed to be used for comfort heating in New York City because there are some hazards and risks associated uh, in this dense urban environment that uh, has a significant subterranean, subterranean ecosystem. Uh, this propane is heavier than air, and if there is a leak, uh, it can collect in subways, in cellars, and in basements, and uh, create a, a problem for those folks who work and live uh, in or near those buildings, right? So, uh, but what we'll do, which we think is uh, user friendly, is give them the ability, like I said, to submit that attestation reflecting that they understand the hazards, that they understand how to safely uh, operate the devices, that they'll situate those devices uh, in, in compliance with the parameters that we'll put out in that guidance, uh, and that that affirmation will also serve as a permit application so they can get up and running and then within three weeks we're going to request that they follow up with a requirement to get the appropriate certificates it's one certificate of fitness actually in the past it was two certificates of fitness uh we've uh collapsed that to one to again make it a little, little more user friendly for the business owner uh, and whatever other paperwork that has to come to us, I think we're going to ask for a um, hand-drawn uh, uh, plan be submitted reflecting how they're going to configure the location of the propane heaters. Uh, so I think you'll see that we'll have available uh, to, to this community um, uh, guidance that provides a, a safe and fair approach to uh, managing propane as a heating option. Of course, there are those other two, electric heating as well as the pipe natural gas for those restaurants that, um, based on their location, configuration, and, and other limiting factors, may not be able to uh, take advantage of uh, propane as an option. Y esperamos de nuevo de que con lo que estamos haciendo como ciudad, Todos los restaurantes de nosotros pueden seguir operando todas sus capacidades. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Um, Chair Cohen, do you want to acknowledge Councilmember? Oh, uh, we have been joined by Councilmember uh, Mark Levine. Thank you. I'll now call on Council member, do you have any, actually, sorry, do you have any additional questions, Chair Cohen, or can we move on to council? I do, but let's go through the, the members uh, who have their hands raised and then I'll come back. Okay. Um, I'll now call on council members in the order that they have used this Zoom raise hand function. You should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we'll hear from council member Ku, followed by council member Holden. Councilmember Ku. 
Starting time. Hello. <clears throat> Uh, commissioners, thank you for coming to testify. Uh, my question is uh, mainly uh, towards the Transportation uh, Commissioner Trottenberg. As you know, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg, uh, we have a pending uh, busway in downtown Flushing. So if this busway carry out and it will force all the other cars to, all, to the side streets. And if you have this permanent side, uh, out, uh, outdoor dining, you will create a lot of problems because the side streets, the sidewalks or the streets are occupied by uh, many, many restaurants. And, 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 and you force all these cars to go in, uh, you will create a big traffic congestion in all the peripheral areas. Uh, and also, the, the permanent uh, outside dining will create problems for sanitation. When How do they pick up sanitation? I mean, the, the garbage, when the sanitation trucks are so huge, if they come and you will block the traffic for like 20 minutes for the whole block, and, and you will create safety problems. Uh, many restaurants, they stay on the sidewalks. So the sidewalks in Flushing are very narrow. And many uh, pedestrians, especially senior citizens, they use a walker or they use a wheelchair, or uh, many uh, people love to carry a shopping cart uh, to uh, walk on the streets. Um, and they were very really slow. So you will be a lot of problems for pedestrians, uh, for sanitation. And then what happened uh, if there are apartments upstairs. See, in many uh, side streets, it's not only business. We have a lot of apartment buildings on the side streets. And all these people will have to tolerate all this noise, smell, uh, all year round. Now, I have nothing against the restaurants. And I think the mayor he has good intentions to pull out this proposal for permanent uh, outside dining. But not every street corner is the same. So I hope uh, you guys will consider all the points uh, I just mentioned, especially uh, you said uh, we have to have a busway in downtown Flushing. That is a terrible idea. I don't know how you put two together, put all the restaurants on the side streets, uh, on, on the streets, on the sidewalks, and then how the pedestrians you know, um, uh, navigate on these congested streets. Uh, you create a safety hazard uh, for the pedestrians, uh, for the fire department, and for the uh, people who live upstairs uh, on these restaurants. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Councilmember Ku. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take a, a crack at, I think, both of the things you raised, the busway. Um, and I, I certainly know we received letters from you and Senator Stavisky and the community board and the Chamber of Commerce and your attorneys. Um, and I, I think you know my office has reached back out and, and we will certainly be sitting down to talk to all of you. We're, we're trying to do it this week. So um, hopefully that, that dialogue will continue. And I, I hear what you're saying is, you know, I've been out and flushing a couple times and understand that some of what we've been able to do nimbly and quickly in open restaurants as we refine the program and make it perfectly we are going to have to tackle some of the very issues that you raise how we balance the sort of the local neighborhood concerns make sure the sidewalks are accessible particularly for people with disabilities and make sure that all our street functions can also happen as you you mentioned sanitation or, or snow plowing or resurfacing all the things the city needs to do so i think as i mentioned in my testimony we very much agree those are the issues we need to make sure we resolve as, as we make this, this program permanent. And as I said, not, there's not one size fits all flushing of very dense and vibrant neighborhoods. We wanna make sure this program uh, works there as well as it'll work everywhere else in the city. Yeah, because uh, uh, especially now you mentioned you have propane gas on the streets. I think this is kind of dangerous, you know? Uh, and the, the, 
the devils are in the detail, you know. When you have too many agencies involved, that means no agencies involved. You know, I have the same experience in downtown. Streets are controlled by DOT, by MTA. I'm inspired. By, by sanitation. When we have garbage problem, nobody take the, do the job. Because everybody's push, pushing the, uh, the job to the other agency. Oh, it's not my job. It's not his job. So nobody's doing anything. So at the end, the people suffer. And the business suffer too. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ku. Next, we have Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Reynoso. We missed him in the first go around, so we'll be um, skipping to him. Council Member Holden? Starting time. Uh, thank you, Chairs, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Trottenberg. Uh, and I want to thank you for your outstanding work on the outdoor dining. I know you didn't sign up for that one, but uh, on top of everything else you're doing, you're doing an amazing job on that, and certainly for the Open Streets program. Um, I just want to talk about the uh, tent enclosures, which you, you mentioned. Uh, um, we've seen some very creative tent enclosures. Um, are there designs that DOT won't approve? Um, and like the materials, for instance, or flammable enclosures? Um, I, I'm actually going to sort of turn to FDNY on the flammable issues, because that's area of, of our expertise. And, and look, another thing I know early on, there was a bit of back and forth about tents and umbrellas, and I apologize for that. I think we've, the city has settled on a pretty liberal policy, which is allowing a lot of these different kinds of structures in place, as long as they're weighted, they can be taken down in the case of inclement weather, and they allow open air. What the mayor announced last week for outdoor, for sort of the permanent outdoor dining is a restaurant can either have two sides of their outdoor space tented, and so there's still a lot of open air, or they can fully enclose it, but then they will have to abide by what is currently the 25% occupancy race. I know you'll, you'll hear from industry colleagues today. They hope that that will soon be a higher percentage. And, and I'll let FDNY speak about the materials and the flammability question. Would you like the fire department to respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we're waiting for. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, the fire department does uh, regulate uh, tents uh, and requires that the, uh, the fabric be flame resistant or treated with a flame retardant, uh, that no smoking signs be conspicuously posted, uh, and then has a series of parameters relative to uh, the location of tents from things like generators and vehicles and other um, devices with combustion engines and such. So uh, yes, there are provisions in the fire code that contemplate the uh, safety of the tent. Uh, I do believe the tents that uh, are above 400 square feet are further regulated by the Department of Buildings. So, you, so, um, so then a restaurant owner is facing, Commissioner, the restaurant owner is facing multiple agencies to put up, uh, let's say, a simple enclosure, um, or can they just go through DOT and then you'll you'll speak to them? Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Trottenberg. There, um, I, it's a very good question, Council Member Holden. Let, I want to make sure um, we will have a unified uh, voice for all the restaurants so they'll know exactly what the rules are on tents. Um, it will probably, yes, come through through DOT, but I will double check that I make sure that I rope in all the concerns of my agency colleagues, including, as, as you heard from the chief, FDNY and Department of Buildings. Yeah, and I, do, I just want to ask you, because we've had a number of cases in my district where um, a restaurant has a small footprint in front, but they have let's say a business next door that's not using the um, their outside or a business that's not there anymore. Um, do you work with those restaurants to see if they could use that space? Yeah, I, I will admit we didn't have a formal process to do so. And I certainly know that a lot of restaurants kind of did it anyways. What the mayor announced last week is we are going to have a formal process okay. um, where the two businesses will need to agree. And obviously one thing we want to be sure of is that the business that's sort of generously letting their storefront area, sidewalk area or street areas is not 
charging anything for that because they, they don't own it in that sense. Um, but we will be hopefully in the next few days putting out the guidance on that. And we certainly want to encourage it. We think it'll help a lot more restaurants either get more space or be able to participate in the program. And we'll say to all of you, if you have restaurants um, that want to do that and need guidance, send them to our, our borough commissioner's offices and we'll start working with them. Yeah, the weak, the weak link in this is, so I want to echo council member Reynoso's concerns about the SLA enforcement because uh, that same restaurant that took over space next to them were set upon by the SLA uh, saying, that's not your address, uh, so you can't serve liquor here, which is kind of like, you know, really nitpicking uh, enforcement. And it's really in this climate, it's, that should not be done. So I just want to hope that the SLA, and we'll speak to them, we'll write them letters to try to kind of back off a little bit on that. If they're right next to you, their premises, leave them alone, please, and let them try to recoup some of the money. We, but we've, thank heard, you. we've heard that too. And that's Councilman our part, in part why we want to make sure that this is a more formalized process where we have sort of a documented agreement. The uh, city hall is talking to SLA. So hopefully we will get them to, to back off in those enforcement situations. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, now we'd like to call on Councilmember Reynoso and followed by um, Councilmember Levine, as I understand he's in another hearing and um, may need to uh, hop off this call. Councilmember Reynoso? Sergeant? Starting time. Thank you. Uh, you know, nothing makes me happier than to see Bob Holden become an open streets advocate. So I'm extremely, I'm extremely happy to hear that. Uh, but he, uh, he did mention something related to tents, Commissioner. I think the, a part of the success that we had originally um, in the lessons learned, I guess this is a, a good lesson learned, is that we had like one agency, just DOT, kind of be the, the do all end all. Uh, now we're talking about FDNY taking on tents less than 100 feet, 40 feet here. And then DOB comes in, why not just give the authority exclusively to FDNY um, and keep DOB out of it uh, for the most part? Like why do everything we can to limit uh, how many agencies insert themselves into the regulating of, of outdoor dining? I, I, listen, I think this is, this is good feedback. You know, the mayor just announced this all last week. So uh, hear what you're saying, let, let us Great. bring this back to City Hall. We understand, we, we wanna try and make this one-stop shop and not make mm -hmm. it complicated and, and full of red tape for restaurants. So I think we can figure out a way to get there. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, also, some of these structures that are being built are extremely elaborate. Um, and uh, I, just make sure that we get guidance as to what then becomes like an enclosed uh, sidewalk and like really having a good, I, I just, um, I, I, lessons learned, I think you said, it, we wanted it to be free flowing. We wanted it to kind of let the businesses figure it out. And we were kind of just giving um, instruction thereafter. I think that was the right way to go. Some businesses, it, it didn't help um, uh, uh, initially, but overall, I think most businesses said, would think that this is a success. So I just want to make sure that we have those things in order. And I'll give an example. If it's electrical heating, we're going to have to put uh, what small businesses call yellow jackets running to, um, to the curb lane to connect heaters to power. Um, so uh, just making sure we have clear guidance as to how that looks, what that looks like, like paying attention to these little things. Uh, the SLA, I'm glad that you're speaking to the SLA. What I'm hearing from you, Commissioner, and if you could just uh, c confirm it, is the SLA will take guidance from you. This adjacent property situation is a big problem. Um, are you saying that once you come up with the, with the guidance that the SLA is going to abide by them? I, I want to be careful and not speaking for them. And, and those negotiations are happening at a, at a high level, frankly, between City Hall and SLA. And I, I will say um, we certainly work with them to, to put out the first iteration of the program and, and we're going to work with them on this adjacent space question. But I, I don't want to speak for them that I think we've, we've resolved every question. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that we're quite there yet. Okay. Certainly. Then, yeah, yeah I, I, us too. I... I, I got into a, a, a heated debate with a restaurant owner that thought that we were um, we were setting them up for failure. They said, you give us this all this this great uh, outdoor dining with very loose regulations. And then the SLA comes in and just destroys us for the same regulations that you've just approved that you just told us we can do. And I felt I felt terrible 
that he was having that type of experience considering that our goal here is to do everything we can to help them and make this easy. So I just want you to know that your communication with the SLA, I think is gonna be a rare, a, a, an important thing. Um, I also wanna go- Can uh, I just add yeah. council member? I yeah. think SLA hearing from all of you is, is helpful as well. Okay. All right. I'm not a, I always tell folks I'm not the assembly member or I'm not the senator. I'm not a state rep. And they were like, um, that's punting it is what they told me. I was like, no problem. I'll write my letter and I'll do my part. And I'm hopefully with uh, the support of the chairs here, maybe we can write a joint letter from the city council to the SLA saying we really hope that they can uh, uh, abide by common goals and rules here with the DOT. Um, another thing is in order of priority, uh, and this is my order of priority, it's people first, which is public transportation, city bike, um, trains are the first priority on our streets always. And then I say business second, um, and then vehicles last, right? Like I wanna make sure that you know for me that I think the order of things um, should always have the private uh, individual vehicle user be the last line of street usage when it comes to these types of things. If a business wants it, um, if there's a bike rack, if there's a bus stop, that we give that priority over an individual car. And I hope you you heed that for me and that you understand that I'm advocating for you to, to prioritize that way. Um, uh, the last thing, uh, I have one more thing that I wanted to tell you, uh, but my time is running out. So I would just say, commissioner, you've done an amazing job. I think the city is good for, yes, this is what I wanted to say. If not for the coronavirus, our mayor would have never, never allowed fraud or dining to happen. His worldview is very, very narrow when it comes to street space. I'm excited. So I just want to continue to have a conversation with my colleagues that have not necessarily been open streets or rethinking streets advocates or, 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 or thinking about it that way. Just think about how great this program has been, how great safe streets has been, open streets have been. And uh, breaking away from this car-centric individual parking usage mentality will make this city a much more a, a much more a higher quality a quality of life living space. And I hope that uh, we continue to do these type of things. Thank you so much to all the chairs, uh, to the commissioners, um, and to the committee council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. We'd now like to call on Councilmember Levine, followed by Councilmember Powers. Councilmember Levine. Well, Starting thank time. you so much. Thank you so much and thank you to our chairs. I'd like to ask about awning rules and given the extension of dining year round, whether year round awning installation is permitted and what are the rules about uh, material requirements, the approval process, et cetera. I'm not sure if that's a question for you, Commissioner Trottenberg, uh, but perhaps you can clarify which agency would have jurisdiction there. I don't, it's not a DOT issue. Is it Commissioner Salas? Is it I apologize. I'm not sure who does awnings. No, I believe it's the Department of Buildings that actually, uh, you know, regulates the awnings situation. Got it. So a, a related question about the sidings that are sometimes used for awnings during colder months. Uh, would that also be under the DOB jurisdiction? I believe so, but you know, I'll be happy to have my team get back to you to confirm that. But I believe that's also part of the Department of Buildings uh, code. This really will be important to extend usability into the colder months. And so uh, I would love to get some clarification on that. And then just one more brief uh, procedural question on the hours of operation that are allowed. Um, will the mandated closing time be the same for indoor dining? and outdoor dining, you can see why otherwise that would be an operational problem. Yeah, th th that, that question has arisen when we originally announced the outdoor dining, it was till 11 at night because we were, I think, trying to find a good time that worked for restaurants, but also was not keeping folks up at night. The indoor dining has now been announced allowed to midnight, so there is an inconsistency there. Um, I think we are discussing about potentially harmonizing it um, with welcome anyone's views on that topic. I don't know that we've resolved it. And I'm sure the industry will have their own, uh, their own uh, views on it. Well, certainly restaurant owners that, that I've heard from have made the point that it would just be very difficult operationally uh, if you don't have harmonized closing hours. Uh, and just thinking about the indoor space being open for another hour, it's, it's pretty hard to run a restaurant solely on 25% 
of your table space, which is what you'd be left with. So uh, I certainly applaud you for, for working to get a common closing time uh, for all sides of the business. Um, and I, I, your constituents I, would be okay with outdoor dining going till midnight? I think they would, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll canvas folks in the neighborhood on that. I, I've, I've heard mostly from businesses who certainly would welcome that, but uh, I guess this is a chance to get it right. But having a uh, common closing time for both sides seems like the, the right policy. And I, I do also wanna echo uh, what my colleague just said to, to express gratitude to you, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg and to you, Commissioner Salas for for making outdoor dining happen. Uh, it's just been a game change for the city. We understand how difficult that's been uh, to put into practice. Um, we're grateful that it's happened quickly and that now it's gonna extend through the winter. Uh, it's just making New York City more livable and it's been a lifeline to, uh, uh, to our businesses. And so I wanna thank you for that. That's it from me, back to you, to the, back to the chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. We'd now like to call on Councilmember Powers, followed by Councilmember Lander, who had a question earlier but had to leave and is now back. Councilmember Powers? Starting time. Thank you, and thanks everybody for the questions and the opportunity to speak. Um, I, I'll just wanna start by saying that I think this has been an outstanding success. And uh, the SLA has been the worst part of it in their um, changing enforcement and the guidelines to restaurants and bars about how to comply. And it's been patently unfair to the folks in the industry. But for this part of the program that the city's running, it not only is a success, but it was done essentially overnight to get the standing up. And I want to give the agencies the shout out they deserve to make it work. And I think I've actually run into not many issues in my district when it comes to noise or incidents, although I do know they are out there and they exist. Um, and I think it's been a major lifeline to businesses. And I, I think the rapid, um, rapid nature by which you got it up does deserve recognition and applause. So th thank you to all those agencies. Um, one of the issues that I did run into, though, was that there were folks who were really depending on this to be able to make a living and found out that they could not take advantage of it because of where they are situated on the street or what you know what, what their location is. It could be a fire hydrant, it could be a bus lane, it could be other measures. And we, I understand that, I, I recognize the challenge of that. But moving forward, essentially you're putting some at a competitive disadvantage here because they're paying this, you know, they could be paying similar rents but getting half the space for the uh, uh, availability of to use dining. Is there any thoughts or plan about how you might accommodate or help out those who are there but can't take advantage of outdoor dining. Obviously, this was the most critical moment to do that, but even still moving forward, I think we'd like to have the same advantage that others have, which is to be able to expand their footprint. It, thank you for your kind words. And it's an excellent question. And one we have wrestled with. We got the program up and running quickly, as you said, and we, you know, we tried to help as many restaurants as we could. The mayor did announce last week, and we, we've had some discussion of it here today, that particularly, to, I think, to help those restaurants that had a fire hydrant or a bus stop or whatever in front of them, that they can now make use of adjacent space if they can get the, you know, the, the agreement of the whoever is the building owners next door on either side. And that includes sidewalk or roadway. And I will say there that the mayor has directed us to try and problem solve. And so, um, you know, hopefully this will open this program up to a lot more restaurants. But if there are particular circumstances for a restaurant, please get in touch with us. Obviously, you can talk to, to Ed and Jennifer in our uh, borough commissioner's office, and we will, you know, we want to try and help as many restaurants as we can. That's that's the mayor's guidance to us, and you know, we I think we he announced a big expansion um, last week, and we want to continue to make sure we get as many restaurants enrolled as we can. Okay, and is the SLA uh, on board with that? Because that's a, ultimately an SLA issue, being able to use the space next to yours. Right. As I was saying earlier, City Hall, that's sort of being handled above my pay grade, but, but City Hall is in negotiations with SLA. I cannot promise you that every detail has their sign off, but certainly. Okay. I mean, I, cause, cause the only warning I would give to restaurants if they are using their adjacent space is that the SLA license, I believe, only covers the storefront and their space outside. So they, if they do do that, they would be, I think, technically in violation of their liquor license, although I think many are doing it as some arrangement today. Um, how do we, utilities and street cleaning and other access to the street, 
they, I think, would rightfully, either the Department of Sanitation or utilities would rightfully be concerned about their ability to access to do work, emergency or planned. How does that work uh, moving forward to do necessary work on streets where there's outdoor dining? Right, it, it, is a, it is a profound issue, one I, I highlighted in my testimony and one that I think as we make this program permanent, we, we all need to collectively grapple with. People think of our streets as just a place for, for cars, but there is, as, as I think as the chief put it eloquently, a subterranean ecosystem, sewer systems, wiring, subway infrastructure, plus as you mentioned, the, the surface functions, repaving, striping, sanitation, snow removal. Um, we, we need to be sure that any kind of a program we do in the street can allow for all those city functions to happen. And, and that does mean that we're gonna have to have an ability at, at the city level to work with restaurants if we need to do our functions on the street. It, it is it's certainly something that is gonna require some, some push and pull and some balancing. Um, the city okay. does have to maintain those streets and all the infrastructure on the streets and, and underneath the streets. Got it. And just to put this in some summary format, what do you see as the largest challenges ahead to do this in the coming months and to do it permanently? I mean, I think pr precisely the issue that you've raised and, and Council Member Reynoso raised, which is on our busiest corridors, you have competing curb uses, not only restaurants, but as we were saying, bus lanes, bike lanes, bike parking, Time expired. Off, drop off freight. So balancing all of that, particularly on the busiest corridors, and then how do we continue the street operations? How do we also enable restaurants to have some certainty about the space they're able to have and what the requirements are to make it safe and to be sure that the city and the state can, can you know, certify? I think those, those are all things that when we announced this program was only gonna be for a couple months, we didn't necessarily have to fully resolve all those questions. Now that we're gonna make the program permanent, we are gonna have to resolve those questions collectively and obviously, we have our industry partners here. They're going to certainly have a big seat at the table on how we do that. Got it. Thank you. And Commissioner, one final question. What's your favorite restaurant in New York City? Oh, goodness. <laughs> that is a tough question. I, I'll, I won't give a restaurant, but I will mention just because it, it's close to where I live. And I, I cite it as an example of, I think, one of the nice successes of this program, Vanderbilt Avenue over in Prospect Heights. Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, where there are a lot of great restaurants and fun bars, and they've really taken great advantage of this program. I, I patronize a number of them. I won't pick a favorite. Okay. Very diplomatic answer. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. I'd now like to call on Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Lander? Starting time. Thank you very much. Thanks to the chairs for this hearing and to all the agencies for their work. And I'll just start by underlying, underlining what council, all the council members have said, but what council member Powers just said about our gratitude here. I mean, this has been one of the, one of the very best things about this very dark time. You know, obviously from an economic point of view, saving these critical small businesses, from watching our government be able to work together and have these agencies stand something up so quickly at such big scale. I mean, I know we're all very critical of a lot that is going on. This is really like a government get shit done success. Um, uh, as um, Antonio Councilmember Reynoso said, like the streets transformation is just fantastic. I, Fifth Avenue has been wonderful, but I do have to agree that Vanderbilt in some ways, because it's bounded, is just amazing. I've spent a lot of time there myself i've been on dykeman i went to 34th uh to, to the astoria uh open street it's been it's been transformative and and not just in making people see our city as its kind of most you know inspiring self as opposed to what's being said about it in some other quarters but the kind of solidarity that people are showing between neighborhoods and businesses and the people who are out there it's anyway it's, a, it's remarkable and I'm, I'm really grateful for it um and I also actually, we won't do it here, but, but uh, Commissioner Trottenberg, I want to thank you also for even with that going on, being willing to work with DOE and stand up the Open Streets for Schools program, which I think has gotten a lot less attention. But if the numbers of the, the, the schools around the city match within my district, it's also an enormous program that is really opening up street space for our kids. Um, in ways that I think could be also really exciting and, and transformative. So I just want to have that appreciation. Um, I'm going to ask the same questions that I asked Commissioner Salas when we had this initial hearing, because as much as I am uh, thrilled about this program, uh, the one distress I have is that I don't think we are doing enough to share its benefits 
with the workers who work in these restaurants, and we can be doing more in ways that do not impinge on uh, their ability to succeed, even in these challenging times. Um, so I just want to start by uh, asking the question. I think I know the answer here, but the restaurants that are permitted for open streets, they can continue to do delivery. Yes. Well, you know, at the, you know, while they're also having uh, outdoor dining. We can't, I think you're on mute, but you could just not for this part. I know the answer is yes. They obviously are allowed to do delivery. Um, and of course, if they hire their own employees to do delivery, then they, their, their employees are covered by New York City's paid safe and sick leave law, correct? Absolutely, yes. But if they use a service like DoorDash or Instacart or one of the others or Uber Eats and their delivery workers are, are considered independent contractors by those uh, third-party app companies, then those workers do not receive paid sick leave currently, right? That's correct. They wouldn't be covered under either the city or the state or the federal paid sick leave law. Okay, but it would be covered by the legislation that you testified uh, on in a hearing that we had and that we could then make sure those food delivery workers had paid safe and sick leave, even right now during the pandemic. Yes, the, the proposed legislation um, I testified um, on um, certainly would open the doors for these workers to have the same protections as other workers that have a W-2 from the restaurant uh, to get sick leave. Yeah, which is uh, so. And I'll just note, Seattle followed our lead today. We, for Uber and Lyft drivers, gave Uber and Lyft drivers a minimum wage or a minimum rate of pay. Uh, Seattle followed our lead in doing that, which is great. But they're ahead of us on this. They did extend paid safe and sick leave for app drivers. Um, and we should do the same. And we should do it as part of this package. If we are going to extend this program, we should make sure those food delivery workers have paid, have paid sick leave. So I, I hope, and I know a lot of members on here are signatories to that legislation, um, but I hope we'll get it done. It's been stuck since, uh, since April and, and we should pass it. Um, and then I guess my other question is, um, and I don't begrudge them, but, but fast food restaurants, uh, if they wish, are able, able to avail themselves under this program and set up uh, rest, you know, dining outside in front of their, their restaurants? Um, every restaurant that meets the criteria is, is uh, able to do so. Great. And my point is not that they should not be allowed to. I'm, I, you know, I think it's good for them to be able to, but I'll just point out in my time is expiring. Uh, that there's legislation that would require that the fast food restaurants who have been notable um, uh, employers who have uh, fired people without cause or reason could be required by legislation to only fire people for a just cause. And I'm we should expired. also use this opportunity to move forward so that we're not only helping our restaurants and our neighborhoods and all of us like me who love this program, uh, but their workers as well. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this hearing uh, and for all the work, uh, both to the chairs of the committee on the hearing and to the commissioners for their agency work behind it. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. I'd now like to call on Councilmember Chin, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Councilmember uh, Council Chin, please. Starting time. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the chairs. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, first, I wanted to start um, really thank you, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg and, and your amazing staff, uh, especially the Manhattan Borough uh, Commissioner Ed and, and Jennifer and everyone that does the open street and uh, the outdoor cafe. I know that in lower Manhattan, you know, it's, it's been wonderful, but it was also uh, very hectic with restaurants that has so much problem, but they were so beloved. Um, the one on Ann Street, we finally got a solution and everybody just love you guys uh, for helping us uh, solve that problem. Um, but there are unequalness going on. I mean, I seen, you know, restaurants in low Manhattan that happen to face like on Broad Street. I mean, I see the tables and chairs out there with tablecloth. It's almost as if they move the whole restaurant outside. And then I have restaurants on narrow street where they cannot take advantage of anything. So I think the allowing uh, the usage of the space next door, that definitely will help uh, some of the smaller restaurants. Uh, so I think that offering the flexibility and working with the restaurant 
uh, to see how they can utilize this program uh, is really so, so important. Um, so I really hope that we can continue to work uh, with uh, your agency uh, to make that happen. Because even like on Pearl Street, um, we have complaints that you know people took over because the streets are wide on that stretch near Water Street. The restaurant just take over more than half to the streets, and so and and that is a, a closed street. And so I think we really need to look at those. Uh, Share streets are happening in Chinatown, I think, which is great. And one of the things that maybe DOT can look at is some kind of signage like you do in Share Street for the car to go slowly. Like Share Street is like five miles per hour. So motorists, if you happen to drive down the street where there are uh, outdoor dining, then you need to slow down. So maybe there's a way of doing some creative uh, signage. The other thing is that I know it's, it's not DOT, but it's Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, the SLA issue, I think it's the same um, for the restaurant in my district. Um, you know, the enforcement, like the places that we want them to enforce, they don't do it. And they sometimes they don't, they pick on other people uh, rather than the worst offenders and not be able to use uh, their liquor license for next door space is problematic. And we all have to really advocate uh, for SLA uh, to change that. And so I think going forward, it's gotta be some kind of comprehensive um, enforcement or supervision, you know, along with like sidewalk cafe and open street, uh, open dining, because the noise issue is real. In my district, along Archer Street, I'm sure a lot of you heard complaints about those. There should be no live music on the street uh, at all. Um, and even any kind of loud music playing because you have residents on top. And I think that there's gotta be some regulation uh, for the outdoor dining going forward, uh, similar to Sidewalk uh, Cafe. And closing at 11, I think it should stay that way because people do need to get a good night's sleep. Um, so that's something I, I do want the city to really be mindful of. Like we all support a lot of residents, they support the outdoor dining, but there's also it's gotta be a limit in terms of the noise factor um, you know, in this proposal. Uh, so I think going forward, we gotta have better uh, coordinations and really a comprehensive look uh, and how we can make this a permanent situation for New York City, which is, I think, is, is pretty amazing. If you go around many different neighborhoods, you know, in Chinatown, the Lower East Side, the West Village, I mean, a lot of people have been utilizing uh, the outdoor dining, and, and it's like, and I see, you know, customers out there really enjoying it. Uh, but there's also got to make sure that. Um, you know, residents are also being uh, taken care of because there are some, you know, bad actors out there and they know who they are. And we just gotta make sure that, um, you know, they don't just kind of destroy the, the situation for everybody else. So, I'm so I just wanted to, you know, thank uh, the commissioner and, and your staff again for really helping to make this happen. Thank you. And let me just, just respond. Thank you, Councilmember Chin, for all those very useful observations. And I, I've certainly enjoyed what the beautiful uh, setups down in Chinatown. They, they have been terrific. And I have actually seen the, the steakhouse in question on Broad Street uh, right around the corner from, from my offices. So again, I think with the mayor's announcement, we are going to try very hard. Restaurants that you feel need you know, a better opportunity to take advantage of the program, bring, bring them to us. You can bring them to Ed and Jennifer. And we will do everything we can to try and help. and and good input on balancing people's need to get a good night's sleep with uh, obviously making this program successful. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. I'd now like to call on Councilmember Jonai, followed by Councilmember Levin. Councilmember Jonai? Starting time. Commissioner, I just want to echo some of the credit um, that has been given to you. You've been incredible. Uh, as an individual, I am so fond of you. Uh, and we, although we haven't always agreed on uh, issues, 
you've always been there, you've answered the phone, and we've addressed the issue the best way we can. And I know that in many cases, your hands are tied. But we have to learn from past mistakes. And when open uh, restaurants uh, became a reality, many of our restaurants took advantage. They're entrepreneurs. They saw that as a lifesaver for them. They went out, they started building their barricades, uh, making sure that they could use as much space as possible. After investing thousands of dollars into these barricades that were approved to find out that they were not approved. And I go back to some of the questions that were mentioned earlier by some of the colleagues. DOB, DOT, FDNY, SL, that's just at a city level. Then you've got the state. I think to date, over 2,000 liquor licenses have been taken away from restaurants. through No fault of their own, in many cases. Jeopardizing their livelihood and their investment. What can we do to avoid that, for, that re, from reoccurring? And part of the problem is the rollout. The mayor announced right away, restaurants started buying tents, electric heaters, propane heaters in an, in an attempt to get ahead of this. After they invest these thousands of dollars, someone will come back in and say, oh, I'm so sorry, your tent doesn't comply. It's not fire retarded. Oh, I'm sorry, you put an electric heater, you now have an electric extension cord from your place onto this, that's illegal. Uh, fire department says that propane tank is not the right one. You can't return this stuff. You own it. They're at a, they are operating at a net loss. So what guidance can you give? And then I'll ask my second question to avoid that from happening. You're muted, uh, Commissioner. All right. Well, that the committee muted me, Council Member. Thanks for your kind words. And listen, I, I, you know, I will definitely apologize. I think, as as I've said publicly, we we got this program up and running very quickly. We were really building the airplane as we were flying it. And and there's no question that, you know, the initial guidance we put out on how strong the structure should be on the street, we we realized early on, and I wish we could have better anticipated it. But again, this program was so brand new for us that we needed, we needed tighter guidance to make sure that these setups were safe. And, you know, as I said in my testimony early on, we, a, a whole slew of city agencies kind of jumped in the act to try and help make the street setup safe. That was our primary goal. And, and some of you have talked about that today. Obviously we wanna make sure patrons are safe when they're sitting in the street. Apologize for the confusion. You know, I know there were some challenges early on. I can say now, I think it, it probably took us about a month or so, but we, kind of regularized our inspections. The city didn't find anybody. We tried to work with restaurants best we could. And you know, now the vast majority of restaurants, like I think over 97% are have been in compliance with our rules for, for, for a number of months now and, and hopefully are, are operating effectively. So do apologize. We we recognize that the program definitely had bumps early on and it was it was not our intention to try and make things confusing for restaurants. We just wanted to make sure it was safe. Commissioner, I have less than a minute. I want to ask a couple of more questions, but I want you to finish that out. And I've got some other very important questions I want to ask you. All right, well, I will, I will just quickly say, so certainly we're hearing today a continued desire to make sure that the city family speaks with one voice, that we sort of minimize confusion and different messages to restaurants, hear that loud and clear. We'll continue to, to strive to do better on that. Thank you. So let, let's elaborate a little bit further. DOB is obviously going to be responsible for the size of the tent and the weights that hold the tent down. Let's make that public so before they start buying these tents and the type of structures to make them safe or addressed early on, including extension cords, including what type of propane tanks will be permissible. In advance, they're out there now ordering. They're actually ordering, and I'm getting phone calls every day. But let's talk about requirements. When you use propane tanks, I believe there's a requirement for proper ventilation. I have no idea what that is. They certainly don't know what that is. And under these circumstances, the possibilities of partial enclosures versus full enclosures, they're going to spend a tremendous amount of money that will not allow them to adopt those. I'm expired. My follow-up question, I thank the chairs for allowing me to go into this in more detail. Please talk to me about neighbors. 
Is it one neighbor or several neighbors? Can you make agreements with two or three neighbors going down the street uh, to expand your restaurant? And in addition to that, please answer the open streets program. If a neighborhood is fortunate enough to be allowed into the open streets program, and currently in the borough of the Bronx, we have Arthur Avenue now. Will it conflict with other DOT regulations? East Tremont is a prime candidate for this. But now you have a potential, there are discussions, which we'll talk offline about, for road dieting. This is a big concern for this community. So please answer the open streets conflict, the uh, how many neighbors, who's going to be responsible for the type of weight structures uh, that will be used for these structures, um, the tie downs that is, extension cords, um, as well as what type of propane tanks um, will be permitted. Thank you. You're mute. Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry, I was muted again. Um, all right, let me, let me try and answer your question in succession. And I certainly think on the question of propane, I, I will turn that over to, to the chief. I, I would say one thing, in the next couple of days, the city is gonna be putting out a lot of detailed guidance on this. And I would ask you in talking to, to restaurants that you talk to in your district and around the city, hang on, because we're gonna give very explicit guidance. And I think that will help make it clear for folks. In terms of adjacent, what, what the mayor has put forward is you can try and use the adjacent space on either side of your restaurant. You can use both sides if, if you can reach an agreement with the, the building next door. And if there's some very special extenuating circumstances, come talk to us. We will see if we can figure out a solution. Commissioner, the devil's in the details. When you say property next door, is it the landlord or the one commercial space? It's the, bil it's the building owner. The building owner. So the yeah. building owner can be 100 feet wide that whole 100 feet can be utilized. If the building owner agrees, yes. And again, council member, we will be putting out specific written guidance on this and a template of what the agreement will look like. We hope to have that out in the next couple of days. Perfect. And the other questions, please, if you don't mind. And then I don't know if the chief wants to talk about the, the propane. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in and just uh, address the propane question, there will be guidance coming out later that will uh, detail the, uh, the regulations surrounding the use of propane heaters. Uh, but I think it contemplates the most typical propane heater, which uh, uses a 20 pound propane cylinder. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's all I can advise you right now, uh, council member, is to uh, await the uh, uh, ability to take a look at that guidance and then encourage your uh, constituents to, uh, to to take a look at that closely. What about extension cords for the electric heaters? Yeah, so that's the purview of the Department of Buildings. Unfortunately, I can't comment on those specifics. I apologize. I think the commissioner wants to respond. Um, I, I will just say, council member, we, we will have guidance on, on all of that, and, and it will be harmonized amongst the city agencies on, on, the, on the, the electrical court issue as well. Thank you, council member Jonai. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to members of the administration, if you can please be un unmuted, it takes a minute, there's a bit of a lag for us to unmute you um, when you mute yourself, so we'd ask that you please stay unmuted. Um, for the question and answer period. Thank you. Um, I am unmuted, so you know. I think for FDNY, there's a bit of feedback, so we'll be muting and unmuting but for everybody else if they can please um, remain unmuted. Thank you. And apologies for the technical confusion. Uh, Council Member Levin. You're up for questions, followed by Council Member Rose. Thank you very much. Starting time. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, my question is, uh, and I think you alluded to this in your testimony, Commissioner Trottenberg. Um, you know, as for approaching this question of um, making 
um, making the street uh, uh, restaurant use permanent. Um, how are we considering how this essentially is giving a benefit or conferring a benefit to the owners of the property and not necessarily the businesses at all the time? Obviously, it helps the businesses. It's helping the businesses right now. If those businesses um, uh, were to go go under, um, how do we uh, how do we assess the um, it, the increase in value to the owner's property as a result of this? Um, you know, and then does that? I mean, do we do we collect more property taxes as a result? I mean, are we thinking through these issues? Um, um, again, I'm I'm. I'm all for taking parking spaces. I, I, I also, you know, there's also a balance to be struck in terms of um, how much of that space should really be converted into public use and whether this is, you know, in some sense privatizing public space. So um, I don't know if you, you want to, I know you spoke about that before, but if you want to speak a little bit more. Um, yeah, Council Member, thank you. I think that is actually one of the most profound and challenging questions here. I think in the course of sort of an emergency in the pandemic, when in a lot of ways our streets were pretty empty, um, and we all wanted to help not only do what we could to help our, you know, our restaurant industry, but obviously they employ hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. And it, it felt, I think, very public spirited to say we're giving restaurants as of right streets and sidewalks um, to use for commercial purposes. I think going forward as a permanent program, that is a very complicated question and exactly for the reason you raise, which is in a sort of emergency order several month period, the beneficiaries are the restaurants who happen to be there at the moment. If this becomes you know, a permanent feature attached to a particular private property, then the balance sort of tips and it becomes somewhat a value more captured potentially by the building owner who after all, when one restaurant goes, they can create a lease with a new restaurant and factor in the value of this public space into that lease. So it's a very, I think a very challenging question and I don't have great answers for it today. I, I think certainly the legal experts from the city and the council uh, really need to sit down and wrestle with how we create a permanent program that helps an industry but retains the, the value of what is public right of way um, for the public. Right. I mean, just to, to, you know, contrast that with, with how we do sidewalk cafes, which is, you know, pretty, um, you know, we, we, we end up, it's pretty labor intensive on, I think, on everybody's part. It, you know, certainly here at the council, we have our land use division takes uh, sidewalk cafes very seriously. And I, I'm sure I'm not the only council member that's negotiated specific numbers of tables and chairs um, uh, on, on specific restaurants. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I support our, our, our restaurants. I support our small businesses. I've introduced legislation that would create a commercial rent stabilization framework, which, um, you know, could potentially address some of those, uh, rental increase issues, but, um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's something to kind of, um, you know, maybe think through, um, you know, over the next few months as we kind of try to thread the needle. Agreed. Okay. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Levin. I'd like to call on Council Member Rose. Hi, Commissioners. Um, Time time. Hi, Commissioners. I, I want to thank you for your time. And I, I just want to congratulate you on the success of the open restaurants program, you know, and um, I really want to applaud all the efforts um, to have the various agencies move away from working in silos. Can you hear me? Yes. From, okay. Working in silos, you know, um, I just wanted to ask for the sake of efficacy and financial and economic concerns of our businesses that um, that the messages, the guidance, um, the new rules um, are consistent and appropriate and are completely communicated to our businesses 
you know, before they make the investments to try to comply with all the new rules and and that the enforcement is um, consistent across all of the agencies. You know, I'm really concerned about how the um, the message, the guidance, and the communications are are gotten to our businesses. Um, it was a common concern um, and a, a problem uh, that I heard repeatedly, were that um, oftentimes they uh, they thought that they were um, working within the constraints. Uh, that were given, and they made investments uh, only to have to uh, change them. And so um, I'm really, I'd really like to know, how are we um, communicating with the businesses about the new, the new, the guidance or the new rules that, you know, are going to go into, um, into force? Yeah, th thank you for the question. And as I, I think I responded to Council Member Joe and I, look, we acknowledge we were getting this program up and running very quickly. A lot of city agencies jumped in to help and, and you know, we were not perfectly aligned on everything. And we certainly apologize for that. And I think we have tried, I'm hoping you're hearing fewer complaints. We've tried over the weeks and months to have a more unified approach to standardize our rules. We have put a lot of information online, including videos on how to do a setup. My agency, we stood up basically a, a phone and email operation that has taken thousands and thousands of calls and small business services has done the same. Um, you know, we have tried through social media working, you know, we have, we have Andrew Ridgey here from the Hospitality Association and other such groups. We have tried to put out the word in every way we can. And obviously we have worked with, with a lot of you here on the council. Um, we will continue to try and do that, you know, suggest, look, it's something we know we can always do better. The restaurant industry is, 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 is big and diverse. And I think a lot of us have also tried to make sure we're getting our materials into many, many different languages, because obviously we have restaurateurs who, who hail from every corner of the globe. Um, you know, if, if there are ideas about how we can continue to do better, we would certainly like to do so. But I, I think we have certainly over the weeks taken the criticism to heart that the, the, the program started off, you know, with a lot of different agencies jumping in and, and we've tried to make it a more unified set of messages, requirements, education, enforcement. Oh, and we're not and we're not going to penalize them for any mixed messaging that, you know, that's that's been, you know, distributed, that's out there. Right. Uh, the or we, we're giving them like notice notification or warnings or or times to mitigate whatever yes. Yes, the, yes. the problem was. Before. I, I will say for, for DOT, again, we have not fined any restaurant. I, I know SLA ha has been finding restaurants and, and that's a state agency. I, I can't speak to what they've been up to. DOT has not fined any restaurant. And I think, I know you probably say some of your restaurants heard from us many times early on, but that was because we were trying to work with restaurants. And I wanna thank my team, my HICO inspectors, who, who many of you know, cause you see them out in your neighborhoods. Those, those men and women spent hours in the hot sun this summer talking to restaurants, walking them through with diagrams. We put together a video. Um, and you know, I think in almost all cases, we were able working with those restaurateurs to get to a place, again, with a goal, particularly for DOT, of having a safe setup in the street, which I think we all share that goal. We don't wanna have a tragedy happen with a, with a structure that's flimsy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. I'll now turn it back to the chairs, Chair Cohen. Uh, you know, I, I just, in the spirit, I know I'm trying to run the hearing efficiently and which is why maybe I didn't take a second also. I should have acknowledged, uh, I, I do think that open dining has been a spectacular success. And I, and you know, I was skeptical at the last hearing when we talked about uh, what the implications would be and how it would you know fit in with the community that I represent. And I, and I have a lot of the outdoor dining uh, establishments in the Bronx. Uh, and it is, and there were some hiccups, I think it's fair to describe in the initial setup, but I think your testimony, I can corroborate your testimony in that uh, those hiccups seem to have gone away. And, you know, when I go in to, to my local restaurants uh, and talk to the owners, everybody is satisfied with the way uh, things are running. So I just did want to acknowledge that. Thank you. I, I do have a, a few more questions. Um, uh, I, maybe this is FDNY, but are, are we concerned about uh, self-certifying uh, and uh, the and using the heaters? 
is it, you know now because we we want to eliminate the the requirements of having an architect or a professional do the layout, and now we're adding an additional complicating element of the heater. Are we concerned about that, or do we think that that that, that can work? Well, it's it's not complete um, self certification, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's a uh, to start. They're going to, in a sense, self certify by submitting an attestation to us. But in that attestation, it will clearly reflect that they have some follow up, um, you know, administrative activity to uh, to complete before it's it's all finalized, including um, uh, taking a test for a certificate of fitness and then being subject to uh, to our oversight. Right. If we happen upon uh, that location and conduct an inspection, of course, we'd we'd expect that it would comply with the parameters that will be in the guidance. So, so FDNY is not just going to say, "Oh, they provided the plan, and we we'll check the box," but you're going to do a more substantive review of what they of what the applicant submits. Yes, indeed, um, we'll review the uh, the submittals and um, and then follow up, like I said, uh, with, uh, with 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 the business owner to ensure that it's meeting our expectations of achieving uh, a safe environment given the use of that that uh, you know potentially hazardous propane right we're trying to manage so we're all protected right so thank you uh Com commissioner trottenberg yeah you know, again I, I when i in my first round of questioning i sort of was a little concerned about you know that we're calling this a permanent program do you think that an outdoor dining program might look different in a you know if there ever is such thing as a post-covid world it might look different than the one we're trying to develop to try to get us through the circumstances we currently face and might it be kind of smarter to take an approach of like we have an immediate crisis and we want to try to support the restaurant industry through the crisis and then try to also look for maybe a, you know, a longer term plan that, you know, for the reasons that, uh, you know, council member uh, Levin and Reynoso and Atlanta talked about that there are, you know, re-envisioning our streets doesn't have to be done at the, at the, you know, at the tip of a, a COVID gun. Like we could do it in a way that's more thoughtful and less reactive, frankly. I, I think that's right, uh, Chair McCohen. I mean, I, I certainly think, as I've said, we got this program up and running quickly in response to, you know, a real sense that our, you know, our restaurants were, were in desperate need of assistance. A lot of the sort of normal city functions that we would do on our streets, we sort of, we let those go for a few months. A longer term permanent program has to tackle those issues. And I, I will just say in spirit of that, I hope that, that I know the council and you've been great partners on this and we're so appreciative and you've been so nimble in your legislative approach, but I think for the decisions about making a permanent in perpetuity post COVID program, we, we should take a little time and get it right. Um, Cause obviously even just listening to all of you today, you all bring diverse opinions on some of these very weighty topics, you know, DOT and all our sister agencies, we have our own expertise to bear. I, I'd like to be careful we didn't codify anything as you sort of put it in the COVID heat of the moment that two years later when hopefully COVID is in the rear view mirror we realize perhaps doesn't doesn't fit the times anymore. Yeah in, in that spirit and I, I'm, I'm trying not to be you know flippant but like I've been concerned as, as this hearing was approaching as we you know if we take the outside and uh, you know we put it in a tent and we wrap it in plastic and we try to heat it at what point does the outside become the inside? Uh, and ultimately, we're doing this as you know, the reason that we don't have indoor dining in the first place is there's a, a public safety concern. And, and I'm I'm concerned about how, you know, that you're going to be able to serve customers in an environment that is you know reasonably warm and comfortable and yet uh, safe in terms of or, or reduces or minimizes the risk of COVID transmission. And I realize you're the DOT commissioner, not the health commissioner, but uh, I, I don't know if there's, you know, that's, I guess, again, in, the, in my original questioning that I think the Department of Health has to play a role here in making sure that we have a, a safe plan. Right. Well, and certainly I think it was the Department of Health's guidance that, um, as obviously the governor has determined, at least for New York City, and I know there's a lot of unhappiness about that above my pay grade, that we're only going to be at 25 percent um, capacity starting today that you know enclosed outdoor space should mirror that and, and i think you're right mr chairman the genesis of this program was that restaurants could not serve inside and so we were giving them outside space i think though that the program has opened our eyes up to some bigger possibilities which is 
the restaurant industry was let's be honest sort of struggling before coronavirus and this opportunity for them to have extra space i think is something they will potentially want even when coronavirus is gone and i think certainly i've heard hearing it from some of you today and from many other new yorkers people really like having more outdoor dining um coronavirus aside and i think balancing those other sort of good outcomes of this program, you know, part of what I think the administration wants to make sure, working with the council and the industry, that, that we get that balance right. But I, you would agree that, I mean, there are other models than the one that we're implementing. Uh, you know, you know, I know that we mentioned that your offices are downtown, but I think it's Stone Street down there where you could have, you know, you could have dedicated sort of areas where this is done and make the entire street available, which would you know, could deal with some safety issues. Like there are other models than the one we've just implemented. And I think that we should have our eyes open and kind of, again, do it in a thoughtful way. Right. Well, and, and I think the open, the open streets call and open restaurants is sort of an attempt to copy the Stone Street model, which is completely closing off the street, where now we have, I think, 84 locations around the city, are, you know, where we're letting, uh, it was started only to be weekends. We're now letting it in some places be seven days a week. The challenge we faced when we first started this program was, you know, yes, the Stone Street model is ideal. It's the safest, it's it's the most delightful, but Stone Street's a very unique little spot where actually all the restaurants have streets that they face out onto, and that interior space that people sit in is really more of a courtyard than an actual street. And we just realized we couldn't implement that citywide in a flash. Certainly going forward, we agree. That's a very nice model. Yeah. Well, you say in a flash, but again, if we're if we're looking at you know sort of again in a post-COVID world, and, and you know we don't have the Department of Health here, we don't have the city you know Department of City Planning here, but you know there there could be ways that we could uh, I think uh, encourage uh, Stone Street type model setups uh, through zoning or through other you know rulemaking that that we might want to take advantage of. Uh, you know, one last concern. Um, I've seen it in, uh, in my own district. Uh, deliveries, I think, are challenging uh, uh, in in this, in the setup that we have now. Uh, what has DOT encountered in terms of dealing with that, and and particularly, you know, maybe I, you know, as the economic vitality comes back, and uh, you know, what do you what what challenges are related to that? And and again, right, just to sort of go back to that Stone Street model. That's part of why Stone Street works. The restaurants all get their deliveries on the streets on the other side of their building. So, you know, a lot of the street function, they still get to have that and have that beautiful outdoor space, right? In, in a lot of commercial districts, you don't have that. The street has to be everything. It has to be now the places for, you know, the restaurants, the buses, a, as well as commerce and so forth. Um, I don't know that I have an easy answer there. We, we obviously, uh, for the restaurants themselves and for the rest of the city, need to make sure we can still have a flow of commerce. And that, that's a challenge. As you look at a Stone Street model, that, that is a challenge you have to work through. I know in some European countries where they have a lot more Stone Street type models, deliveries happen in the early morning hours, and then the street is closed off for the rest of the day. I, I think we can potentially look to do a lot more of that as well. Okay. I think um, uh, Chair Rodriguez has a, a second round, and I, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And look, first of all, and I feel that as you have said that from Riverdale to all the area that you represent to Eagwood, the whole world and, and Bronx, Manhattan to the five world, we have seen how important how being the open street restaurant. And I think being fair to everyone, no one from mayor, commissioner, council member, speaker, governor, was been thinking that we will have a open street initiative as, a, as the one that we have today, if we will not be hit from the coronavirus. I think that our challenge is this, and it's like a one generation things that happen is how do we come out from this crisis a stronger? That's the type of leadership that we need at this moment. And I feel that all those questions and suggestions that we have brought today and the great participation also from all the commissioners, 
is what we should be bringing and putting together in order to come out from this process as stronger than ever. And thinking that coronavirus will be over, the open street restaurant will be in place. What is the structure that we will have in place to oversee this program? And in that direction, Commissioner, so far, like how many uh, members from your team are dedicated to open street initiative? And, and of course, as you have said before, you know, this is something that is new. And I don't know how much of your budget from other uh, in a need has been taken away in order to uh, dedicate the team you know, of people yet to focus on the open street initiative. But since we gotta be thinking about money, uh, what is, how does the team that oversee the open street initiative look like inside DOT? Do you see as a possibility that as we move on, we have a more solid inside team of people dedicated to oversee all the uh, open street initiative? Activate check. It, it's open a, restaurants. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's a great question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for asking it. And I want to, again, just take a second to thank my team, because I'll admit when we when we jumped into this, a lot of things we didn't know, we had to learn on the fly. And it is it is sort of pulled folks from many different parts of my agency. I would say that hundreds and hundreds of uh, DOT team members became part of the effort, starting with um, you know, our traffic planning and management group that had originally run street seats and our plazas and were sort of the brain trust in starting to think about how we put this program together. Um, they also became very involved. They, they were part of Open Streets and then Open Streets restaurants, Eric Beaton, Sean Quinn, a whole big team there, our borough commissioner's offices who have taken a lot of incoming, worked with a lot of you, a lot of restaurants, a lot of community boards my HICWA inspectors, an extraordinary team of men and women who typically are out looking at construction sites and roadway defects, who suddenly became the restaurant roadway setup inspectors for New York City virtually overnight. And I, I got to spend some time with them out in the field. And it was hard work being out there in the hot sun, visiting every restaurant that was participating in this program, and sometimes multiple times helping them work through this. Our IT division, led by Cordell Schachter, who again, put together so quickly um, the platform for all the restaurants to do that quick and nimble application, the public facing portal that everyone has seen that lists all the restaurants. So um, it's been an extraordinary team effort read by, led by our, our chief operations officer, Marva Forgeny, and, and really in all hands on deck, you are right going forward. Um, as we sort of think through the deeper structure, we, we will need to regularize that to, to some degree. Um, a lot of folks here put aside other duties, um, you know, temporarily to focus on that, but, but we'll have to kind of rebalance uh, as the city continues to get back to normal. Okay, and, and my, I end uh, with this. Last night we saw how New York City is on the attack by Washington. And no, we are not a ghost. No, we are not invisible. No, we are a city that is strong. And I think that the attack last night is to all leaders in government, regardless if we are in the legislative or in the administration. And I think that New York City serves as a role model. And I think that as we have seen before, and that day that, uh, first of all, thank you too also for coming together with your husband to do the bike tour to Northern Manhattan. But when we ended that tour, I went back to a, to Highbridge Park. And when you walk around Eshko in 162nd, you will see a sign with the historic information or the water tower that was used up to the beginning of the 19th century to bring water from Westchester to Manhattan. And one of the reasons based on the information there is that the city decided to start reinventing how to bring water it's because they linked the disease that was created with the tube used to bring the water from Westchester and the health epidemic that we deal with at the beginning of the 19th century. 
So no doubt that this is a moment where we are on call, where we have been created. I think that as we are spending this time to talk about the Open Restaurants Initiative, the city has a big responsibility to bring together leaders and see how in health, in job creation, in education, we will come out with new ideas, with new innovation. So I'm happy with what we have seen. As someone, as I said before, that I served in previous administration and this administration, I also know what it is to be working in an administration that only have a couple of months. And it is more easy yet to focus on criticizing everything that is not working to be rational, understand, yes, we have not been able to accomplish everything, but I'm proud of the work that we have done in both sides. And even though we don't agree on every aspect of any program, including the Open Restaurant Initiative, I think that we are moving in the right direction. I know that when the coronavirus will be over, hopefully months from now, we will continue having a Open Restaurant Initiative that everyone will be proud of. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, have, if you don't mind, I just have one more. Um, uh, in, in terms of complaints about the program from the public, uh, is DOT receiving 311 data? Uh, do you know about, does SLA notify anybody if there is a fine or are they, uh, like in terms of collecting sort of a, a single data point about, you know, complaints where it's not working or where there may be issues? We are, we are, we sort of get complaints from different venues, 311. Sometimes we hear it from, from your offices or, or people go to our borough commissioner's offices. I, I have to confess, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to whether we're sort of notified when SLA does their enforcement actions. I don't think we are, um, but, but I will have to get back to you on that. And, and I would say overall, of course, I, I appreciate what the, the chairman just said. Um, someone who, who spent many years in Washington and knows how New York City is often a symbolic punching bag. He is right. We are not an anarchist city and, and we are not a ghost town. Uh, we, we are, I think, an incredibly resilient place. Um, but I, I think, relatively speaking, for a program of this magnitude and scope, we, we've not gotten as many complaints as, as might be expected. And I, I thank New Yorkers. They've certainly, I think, been sort of tolerant and going with the flow, as obviously we've stood this program up and, and had to to iterate it so quickly. And, um, you know, there's I think there's been a great spirit uh, amongst New Yorkers and, and not so many complaints, but I'll get you those those uh, those statistics, um, Mr. Chairman, if you, if you need them. I, I would appreciate that. I think it, it would just be helpful, I think. Uh, Commissioner Salas, is your, I, I don't know if your agency, you know, I, I know that, you know, the sidewalk, the traditional sidewalk cafe uh, has sort of run through uh, the DCWP, but I, I don't know, are you getting any complaints uh, about, from, about restaurant industry that people are making to uh, your agency? Not, not with respect to street dining, um, so I'm not aware of any complaints. Uh, we do have a um, um, touch point with the street dining from the perspective of doing business, outreach, and education alongside with our partners from SBS. We've been going door to door uh, with the materials put together by DOT and other sister agencies, making sure that in a lot of uh, our neighborhoods that were the most impacted with COVID-19, small business owners who oftentimes happen to be immigrants have the information in their hands, have their questions answered in real time. And we are, um, to date, we've done over 30 of those business education days and, and spoken one-on-one -on -one with 1,500 businesses. So, um, you know, in, in that way, we're collaborating with um, our other sister agencies to get the word out there on this amazing program and to make sure people can access it and uh, without difficulties. I really want to uh, thank the administration for their time. Balkis, we don't have any more, right? Any more questions? No. I really want to thank the administration for their time and the commissioners for their time and thoughtfully answering our questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Chairman Chair. Thomas, Chairman Rodriguez, council members. Thank you. We'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom 
and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Andrew Riggi, followed by Rob Bookman to testify. Andrew, you may begin your testimony after this time. Time begins now. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andrew Riggi, the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Um, there are so many people to thank. So without wasting my time, I'll say thank you to the city council, the speaker, the de Blasio administration, DOT, Commissioner Trottenberg, and everyone who have really been so committed to making the outdoor dining program work for the city of New York. Um, there's a quote often attributed to Churchill, which is, don't let a crisis go to waste. And for all the doom and gloom and all the challenges that this pandemic has brought upon our city and our restaurant industry, outdoor dining truly has been a bright light. And it's helped us reimagine how we can use public space to help not only support our local restaurants, but create a more vibrant, energetic, and resilient New York City. And I speak with restaurateurs, but I also speak with New Yorkers, community boards and others throughout the five boroughs. And they just tell me over and over again about how much stronger and better New York City is with our outdoor dining program. So I wanna thank everyone for making that happen. And I also wanna make sure that we address some of the bills today, which the New York City Hospitality Alliance supports. Uh, 2096, 6655, and 6677. I'll address a couple of points, and I know there was a lot of information provided today that may not be included in today's uh, legislation that may end up being incorporated. One, self-certification is very important. It allows restaurateurs to quickly set up this program and get on a roll without a lot of the expenses and time. Uh, in addition to allowing the different types of heaters and providing the clear guidance, one comment that has been brought to my attention is the ability to use uh, forced air heating systems to heat up tents uh, that are fully or partially enclosed. Um, there was comments earlier about adjacent space. We would like to see, and I don't believe the current legislation- Time has expired. Oh. <laughs> I hope I could go for a moment more, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that would uh, allow us to use the adjacent curb space. We think that should also be uh, included in the legislation. Um, we also want to advise that we understand what we're going from now is a program that was stood up quickly to address the pandemic to a long-term permanent uh, program. And we think that it should be looked at in two phases. If there are going to be additional requirements uh, of the street seating, uh, we perhaps some of the safety requirements could be implemented initially for the winter months of 2020 and 2021. That could be some sort of barrier that's put up uh, in the traffic facing area of the outdoor dining installation. And then perhaps wait until 2021 to add any additional requirements to those spaces. I've heard multiple council members here today talk about the challenges that restaurateurs had in their in within their districts where they set up, built up these installations under the initial guidelines, which a few days later ended up being changed. We know these small business owners are in a crisis. They don't have the financial wherewithal to spend a lot more money than they've already spent on building out these installations. So I would say that this is made permanent now to allow some additional modifications to take uh, effect the following year. Um, as to 2096, uh, this is very important to allow restaurants to uh, uh, operate with basically temporary permits. We know that there are going to be countless vacant storefronts that used to house restaurants, many of which may have had sidewalk cafes and were operating under specific approved conditions. Uh, currently, it could take a very long time for a new restaurant to go into one of these spaces, go through the whole permitting process and get that application. So we would say if a person is bold enough in this environment to open a new Let's let them go in. 
operate under the prior conditions that have been approved at that restaurant until they are able to get their own permit. We think that's business friendly. It'll help support these small businesses. It'll help support jobs. And again, help bring that vibrancy back to uh, the city streets. The third bill is 6677. Um, and this goes back to my earlier point about self-certification. Um, what we have seen through this crisis as well is that we are able to cut through red tape get through this bureaucracy and create a more seamless and small business friendly operating environment. And I think we should use this knowledge that we have now and apply it moving forward. There's no need for a restaurant to spend a lot of money on architectural renderings and certification by professionals in this case, if they're able to uh, create the diagram themselves and provide that um, to the city. So, in all, we are very supportive of all of these bills. We look forward to continuing to work with uh, the administration as well as the council on many of the details that were discussed today to make sure that what we do roll out is the best outdoor dining program for restaurants, for workers, for communities, for the city of a whole. And understand that like everything else, this is an evolving process where we'll continue to, to learn but we must use this opportunity to make outdoor dining permanent, cut through the red tape and create a more resilient city, not just for our small businesses, but for all New Yorkers and create a place where we have these beautiful streets. You go to these neighborhoods, it's just transformed New York City in so many wonderful ways. And it's really provided a lifeline during this crisis. So I wanna thank you all again for your work. We have submitted comments that address some of these issues and others in more detail. And as I mentioned, we'll be working closely with both the council and the administration, making sure that all of the other details uh, and others that may not have been addressed today do get addressed. And we stand committed to the city and New York City's hospitality industry. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I know my colleague and council, Rob Bookman, uh, is going to testify as well. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, I really would encourage our panelists to try to be as brief as possible. There are many, many people who have uh, asked to testify today. So it's, you know, it's going to be a long haul here. So if people could try to respect the clock, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Also, as a reminder, if you don't finish your testimony, you can submit your written testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Um, I'll be calling now on Robert Bookman, followed by Ellen Goldstein, and then Elizabeth Luskin. Uh, Rob? Thank you. I'll do my best to be brief, not my strong suit. Uh, Rather than just do a road thank you, I just want to say to Chair Cohn and the other chairs, if they're still on, and to Commissioner Trottenberg, you folks have all been rock stars in the last few months, and we really appreciate it. It's actually, believe it or not, six months today that restaurants in New York City have been closed. It's, it's a mind-boggling, a half a year. It's really mind-boggling. And uh, you guys have really been rock stars in trying to do what you can to keep them hanging on so that we see the other end of this COVID crisis. These bills, all three of these bills are important. Um, and we don't need to wait for some perfect future, you know, uh, uh, plan in order to get started on what we know we need to do. Uh, we know we need to uh, make it clear to the industry now that there will be some sort of permanent roadside dining. Um, and we know that at some point, uh, Chair Cohen, we will go back into some sort of licensing uh, for sidewalk cafes. And the other two bills, the Callos bill and the Salmonaca bill, are perfect examples of what we need to do to make that process simpler, fairer, and less, expense, less expensive, because it's none of those three things now. These bills make sense, uh, and uh, there's no reason not to adopt them now. Uh, so we will, a good idea is a good idea now, or no matter what other changes we make in the future. And these, both of these are, are good ideas. Uh, if you, you unfortunately want to open a business right now in April or May or June, and it had a sidewalk cafe license previously, you could not have a side, that same sidewalk cafe license for the first season because of the lengthy process. This bill would end that nonsense, and you'd be able to get started right away as long as a previously approved you know, cafe you know, uh, uh, space. So we need all of these bills. They are important. The adjacent space is critical. Um, we should not need landlord approval for adjacent space in roadways. 
That's not their space. They've never had anything to do with it. Adjacent space on sidewalks, however, we understand that we need to work out a system which would allow the, the adjacent building owner uh, to uh, have some sort of approval, and we have no problem with that. That should be the sidewalk space where there is some connection between a building owner and a few feet of sidewalk in front of their building. That's not true for roadways. There's no reason to get a building owner involved with that. I see uh, uh, Council Member Chin is still here, so I just wanted to say to her that uh, as far as closing times, the current cafe law says sidewalk cafes should close at 1 a.m. on weekends and midnight during the week. So it's not excessive uh, to have sidewalk cafes uh, close at midnight uh, during this crisis, um, which we need for businesses um, to try to stay correct. open. And there should be no music at any time, at, live or recorded, out on the sidewalks. We 100% we, we agree with you. My time is up. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have concerning the cafe laws, the rules, or the SLA, because obviously I can answer anything concerning them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. As I see no questions, we'll move on to the next panelist. We have Ellen Goldstein, followed by Elizabeth Luskin, followed by Jessica De La Rosa. Ellen, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ellen Goldstein, Vice President of Policy Planning and Research at the Times Square Alliance. I'm testing on behalf of our president, Tim Tompkins. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, the Times Square Alliance would like to thank Speaker Johnson and Councilmember Rivera for their leadership on open streets and Councilmember Reynoso for championing outdoor dining. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit Times Square particularly hard. Our pedestrian counts plummeted by 90% and over 50% of our businesses remain closed, resulting in an estimated 35,000 lost jobs. Tourism is at a standstill with visitor spending down 94% compared to 2019. Outdoor dining has been a lifesaver for Times Square. Prior to this program, 85% of our restaurants were closed. Today, just under 50% of our restaurants remain closed. While there is still much work to be done, the Open Streets program has encouraged the city to rethink public space as part of a path toward recovery. We hope to sustain this momentum and want to thank the Department of Transportation and other city agencies for working flexibly with bids to make this happen quickly. The Alliance applauds the council for leading the effort to rethink our streets, sidewalks, plazas, and other public spaces in the service of saving our independent businesses. We strongly believe that using public space innovatively through programs like open streets and open restaurants is an essential part of recovery. That said, we hope that this will lead to a comprehensive approach to the use and management of public space so that issues such as curb access, permitting, maintenance, and programming are considered holistically. Demand for public space has never been greater. In order to continue to meet this demand, we believe the city needs a comprehensive office of public space management that can work across agencies. Further, bringing community-based organizations like bids and other nonprofits into the process from the beginning will ensure that projects meet neighborhood needs and are smoothly implemented. We hope to be active participants in decision-making moving forward and look forward to being full partners with the city as we all work together towards economic recovery. We are thrilled about the city's decision to make outdoor dining permanent, and we look forward to working with the council and the administration as they continue to think creatively, implement with flexibility, and be open to experimentation so that our public spaces thrive through COVID and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Next, we'd like to call on Elizabeth Luskin, followed by Jessica De La Rosa, followed by Christine Burtett. Elizabeth, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Luskin. I'm testifying today on behalf of the New York City Business Association, where I serve as a board member. I'm also executive director of the Long Island City Bid. The association represents the 76 individual bids throughout the city that serve as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors with over 100,000 local businesses and, and uh, also of our neighborhood public spaces. Our mission has always been to support local business keep our neighborhoods clean and safe and bring prosperity to our communities. Never has our work been more essential than during this pandemic. We're pleased to present this testimony today, a longer version of which has been submitted. The city's open restaurants program has been a great success, providing a much needed economic lifeline for commercial corridors reeling since the beginning of COVID-19. We're grateful that the mayor and city council have pushed to make the program permanent and will continue to do our part to ensure the program's success. We also commend the open streets program. Many of our members have partnered with the city uh, to make it a success, accepting responsibility for the operations of the street closures at no cost to the city. But the program has strained the already tight budgets of some bids. 
between purchasing and storing of barricades and other expenses, some bids are projecting open streets to account for 10% of their annual budgets. This is unsustainable and the Bid Association calls for the city's support to ensure this program can remain successful. Uh, but the association would like to expand both programs to ensure the benefits are felt by all small businesses and commercial corridors. Last week, we released a proposal for the city to enact an open stores plan to provide the same common sense relief to storefront retail businesses as is being extended to restaurants. Allowing storefront retail to display merchandise and commercial, conduct commercial activity within several feet of the property line and to participate in open streets under the same guidelines and siting criteria as restaurants who participate. All of our storefront small businesses are suffering right now. If we don't do something to help them, especially in advance of the holiday shopping season, we're sure to see countless more permanent closures and job losses. I encourage you to read my full written testimony, which goes into more detail, as well as on sidewalk cafes and adjacent storefronts. We're extremely grateful for the council's attention to the plight of small businesses. We all understand that their survival underpins the survival of our neighborhoods and our city. The bids are on the front line and thank you. And we look forward to continued dialogue and partnership. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next, we'd like to call on Jessica, followed by Christine Bertet, followed by William Johnson. Jessica, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Hi there, everybody. My name is Jessica Del Rosa, and I'm the systems advocate for the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. Our mission is to promote the independence of people with disabilities. I'm here to testify on behalf of UCID and the disability community concerning the amendment, Local Law 77, Intro 2096, which would make street outdoor dining permanent. Local Law 77 did not refer to accessibility and these proposals do not either. It is inexcusable. I preface my comments by making it clear that we support outdoor dining. I can attest from my own experience that when outdoor dining started a few months ago, this made a huge difference to me in the wake of the COVID-19 lockdown. I have enjoyed some nice meals because of outdoor dining. One was at a restaurant that is not otherwise accessible to a person who cannot walk like myself. I had always wanted to eat there, but couldn't because of an inaccessible staircase. However, a few weeks ago, I was able to because of the outdoor dining. Nevertheless, we have serious concerns about the implement, implementation of the program and urge the council to amend these proposals to ensure that people with disabilities are able to travel freely on sidewalks and use the street dining areas without obstruction. I described some of these problems in greater detail below, but first I want to offer several suggestions about how the council should alter this legislation and amendment law, local, uh, law 77 and intro 2096 should. Include specific language that guarantees that the path of travel on sidewalks be maintained with at least 64 inches free from obstruction. Currently, city guidelines require only 32 inches, the width of a doorway for passage, which disappears to nothing when people are standing waiting for tables or waiters get in the way. Include enforcement provisions so that the burden isn't on the public to file complaints through cumbersome 311 process. Instead, require the Department of Transportation, the mayor's Okay, thank you. Finish. Okay, thank you. Um, so that the burden is not on the public to file complaints through a cumbersome 311 process. Instead, require the Department of Transportation, the mayor's office for people with disability, and other city agencies to hire and train personal personal restaurants that violate accessibility rules. Inspector, inspectors should look at access questions for diners, not just whether sidewalks are kept clear. Require restaurants to put up clearly visible city issued signs about how to make a complaint about accessibility violation. They should be posted at each of the space they're using. And self-certification for any new restaurant who wants to join the outdoor dining program from now on. So the so that new problems don't necessarily arise. Let me describe why we make these sorry, proposals. Jessica, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but just to respect the time because your time has expired and we have others waiting. If you can please make sure that you submit your written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We'll be sure to review it all um, and take your comments into consideration. Now, I have a question I'd like to ask her, so. Sure. <laughs> Is your group receiving complaints, uh, specific complaints of where uh, accessibility has been an issue, where the sidewalk was passable before and is not now? 
Yes. And, and, and also it, it wasn't just about the access as well to go down the sidewalk, but it's also, there's been places where the step is too big. So if the di outside dining, outside dining is outside below the street, then we have to go into the street to come around down the curb to sit at the dining area. To even access, to yeah. access the outside dining. That, again, if you have written testimony, you should definitely submit it. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. As I see no other questions, we will now call on Christine Burtett, um, followed by William Johnson, followed by Kathleen Riley. Christine, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. Time begins now. Christine, um, we'll move on to William Johnson. You may begin, time begins. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm oh. in the wrong move. Um, sorry. So sorry, pads... You may begin, Christine. Thank you. Check Pads is a New York City pedestrian rights organization supporting we support the extension of the outdoor dining program year round. This program has helped restaurants, has proved extremely popular, has contributed to a new sense of street and community in our district. And while we all want to help during COVID recovery period, the long-term program requires a different legal framework. Any all year round outdoor dining program should recognize that the overriding purpose of our street and sidewalk is to provide transportation and pedestrian routes through the city. DOT's ability to do so should not be compromised by street or sidewalk outdoor dining. So it is critical that the permits for outdoor dining be time limited with periodic renewals and they also must be revocable upon notice. To put people first and facilitate safe walking, permanent outdoor dining should be on the sidewalk or in the roadway, but not in both. Storm enclosure and tents and owning should not be permitted on the sidewalks as they are not today. And consideration should be given to widening the unobstructed area of the sidewalk from eight to 12 feet. Ideally, a separate walking lane should be created in each corridor where street and outdoor dining is authorized. Check pads urge the, urges the city to generate appropriate revenue from the use of its public spaces. Each Midtown delivery space generates up to $34,000 annually. Landlords are already thinking of raising their rent because of those spaces. To avoid sidewalk overcrowding and excessive noise, CheckPedge urged the city to adopt the SLA regulation, which are all service to seated patron only, no standing and drinking and no music. And we applaud the idea of restructuring sidewalk cafe and open dining in concert to streamline the process. As we are still constrained by I'm COVID sorry. measures, one second, and yet not yet through our first winter, we do not yet have all the facts necessary to legislate. At this time, Czech Fed support a bill making the pro program permanent and leaving a wide berth to DOT to regulate as needed. And please do not forget the pedestrians. Thank you, Steve. Next, we have William Johnson, followed by Kathleen Riley, followed by Rick Stoneback. William, you may begin after the sergeant has called time. Time begins. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is William Johnson, and I reside in Murray Hill, the uh, fourth council district. I'm a licensed tour guide. And of all the questions that one often gets asked as a tour guide from our visitors to New York City, where's a good place to eat? It's a reminder that the revival of dining, uh, particularly outdoor dining, as we've been talking about, uh, is so central to the success of the tourism industry, an industry which welcomed around 66 million people last year. It generated about $6.7 billion in local tax revenue. And so um, just as the 
uh, outdoor dining experience is one that's guided, its success is largely guided by adhering to safety guidelines. We expect restaurateurs to publicize those uh, safety guidelines and to enforce them. We think that the, the double-decker tour bus industry, which has uh, many a traveler and many a diner, uh, should be doing much the same as uh, we look to revive our city. Now, of course, guides are very uniquely uh, situated to enforce the extra uh, conditions of social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, priority one is safety when you're a tour guide. And so that's something that's part of every tour under any condition. And in, uh, in adhering to those uh, new demands, we partner with our drivers to ensure that we uh, avoid accidents, especially with uh, outdoor seating in adjacent uh, traffic lanes. And working together as a team, the driver and the guide ensure that these accidents are avoided and that we help ensure, do our part with the success of the restaurant program and um, also uh, go about uh, helping the revival of our city. We uh, ask on behalf of diners, visitors, and employees alike that you'll consider moving Interim Amendment 289A. Thank you. Thank you, William. Next, we have Kathleen. You may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time begins. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association, and we're here to testify in, in favor of creating a flexible and permanent outdoor dining program for the restaurants of New York City. We're aware that since the hearing has been scheduled, Mayor de Blasio also announced that an outdoor dining program will become a permanent year-round fixture and provided some preliminary guidance. So we'd like to touch upon some of those points, but also to thank the council, especially Council Member Reynoso and the other co-sponsors, for elevating this issue to the point that we have something to go off of already. Um, first and foremost, we're entirely in favor of allowing seating next to adjacent properties with permission. Um, we think that'll greatly benefit people who have been otherwise precluded from participating because of a narrow or obstructed storefront. Um, in terms of the outdoor heaters, which we're so glad to see that there will be forthcoming guidance, we have some questions about how the change in fire code will impact other outdoor spaces not specifically mentioned, for example, backyards or rooftops uh, in regards to the propane heaters. So we hope that question will be answered in the forthcoming guidance from FDNY. We're also supportive of differentiating between enclosed and not enclosed tents. We do wonder why the city is different or sort of creating a new 50% of the side being opened requirement. That's not part of the state rules. The state just requires two open sides requiring a full 50% of tent sides to be open is new. So we wanted to get a better understanding of why that had been put in place. Um, we also wanted to sort of raise the issue of calculating 25% of the capacity of an enclosed tent. Uh, based on feedback we've gotten from operators, the tents don't typically list an occupancy. They don't necessarily have an equivalent to a COI. So we wanted to raise that issue for, um, for the rule makers here. Uh, in terms of the other two uh, pieces from council members Kilos and Salamanca, we're fully supportive of the intent. It seems possible that a permanent open restaurants program may potentially make these moot points or maybe points to be raised in the future, depending um, how sidewalk right. cafes, thank you, uh, are integrate how that system is integrated, but we're supportive of an effort to eliminate red tape and make things as, as easy and efficient as possible. I wanted to quickly touch upon a couple items on the current open restaurants program. Uh, the barrier change that has been discussed earlier in the hearing today did come at a great cost to many operators. Um, participating in the program at all, thankfully the city doesn't charge a fee, but actually constructing those uh, outdoor setups does cost uh, restaurateurs quite a bit of money. And as council member Joan and I mentioned earlier, many of them are operating at a loss otherwise. Um, the adjacent storefronts issue that currently exists will be addressed in the new program. And we also wanted to raise issues with the curfew, which we've gotten a lot of questions about um, because people had had sidewalk cafes that formerly were allowed to be open later. We agree with either trying to harmonize the curfew okay. or raising it in places that are zoned appropriately. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen. And a reminder that you can still submit um, written testimony um, and we'll review all of the written testimony that witnesses submit today at, um, and you can send that at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Next, we have Rick Stoneback, followed by Jay Miser, followed by Andy Sidor. Um, Rick, 
you may begin your testimony as soon as the sergeant calls time. Time begins. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Stoneback and I reside in District 10. I'm a DCA licensed New York City tour guide who has worked as a guide in this city since 1981. I heartily support outdoor dining operating in a safe and controlled environment. With safety being more important than ever due to the pandemic, I wish to mention something I have experience with that has bearing on this subject, safe operation of double-decker tour buses. Dining areas expanding into the streets makes traffic flow more difficult and more dangerous. Due to the pandemic, most double-decker buses are now operating without tour guides, which negates an important layer of safety. Without live guides on the top level, double-decker drivers have to keep an eye on the camera covering the upper deck, as well as punch buttons that activate sections of taped commentary. Both of these actions distract from the driver's attention on what's happening on the street. Also, guides police social distancing and wearing of masks on top of the bus, essential during the pandemic and impossible for the driver downstairs to control. In an effort to preserve safety for outside diners, pedestrians, and tourists alike, I urge you to support Bill 289A, sponsored by my councilman, Idanis Rodriguez, which would make it mandatory for all double-decker tour buses to have a licensed tour guide on the top deck during tours. Now, we all know how important tour tourism is to the financial health of restaurants and to the city at large. Tour guides do a lot to help keep the city safe. And we're, as William said, usually the first resource people use to recommend restaurants. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. I see we have a question yeah. from the chair. Hey, so this question is more to say thank you to the great constituency that I had the honor to represent and yes, this is a legislation that I hope that we can work with our Cali central office and as I know that this bill is also important, not only for the residents of New York City, but also for the TW. So hopefully we can work on and see how we can pass the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As I see no further questions, we'll move on to Jay Miser, followed by Andy Sidor, followed by Leonel Hamanaka. Jay, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time. Uh, it begins. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R. I am a retired trade unionist and a community board member in Washington Heights and Inwood. I wanted to point out that when I briefly walked through about a 15 block area in June, late June, I noticed that none of the restaurants were following the city guidelines, but I did notice many people using walkers or canes walking around to try and avoid the side of the streets where the restaurants were on. Now, given the fact that this was not a restaurant row as exists in the downtown and midtown areas, I'm particularly concerned that, uh, that buses, double-decker buses, might be a great danger to passengers if there are no tour guides, and furthermore, that this might affect the safety of restaurant patrons, many of whom are visitors to our city. And I don't think that getting injured while dining in a fine restaurant will recommend them to come back to New York and provide for our economy. I wanted to thank the committee members for their time and recommend that they include 
289A in further legislation. Time has expired. Thank you, Jay. And we apologize for the misspelling and the mispronunciation. Next, we have Andy Sidor. Andy, Tony, after the sergeant has called. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, my name is Andy Sidor, um, and I've been a New York licensed city tour guide for over 22 years now. Um, as the council considers strategies reopened, attention must be paid to the tourism industry, particularly in the area of double decker tourism. There is a bill drafted by Transit Chair Rodriguez, Intro 289A, which could have led to a safe reopening of this particular branch and to a better and safer normal than before, but the council has not yet enacted it. Meanwhile, some companies have reopened, but not to give the kind of tours they gave in the past, but to run their buses with a few unguided riders wandering aimlessly on the top, simply to justify running the bus around our streets for the sake of the advertising. This is a dangerous situation, not just for the COVID-19 risk currently weighing so heavily on all our minds, but for the risk of accident to the passengers themselves, the very kind of risk that prompted the writing of intro 289A in the first place. The city has long maintained and upheld the right to regulate the commercial tourism industry. The pandemic shows the need to maintain and expand that regulation, not relax it. The CDC guidelines on safety and social distancing cannot be maintained by a recording, just as an unwatched video monitor cannot keep passengers in their seats as the bus moves through potential hazard. When these inevitable affections and accidents occur, it will hobble any hope of this business recovering. We, the city and the industry both, need this safety to be maintained by the same kind of licensed professionals that this city has enabled and overseen since 1937. We need intro 289 to be enacted. That way the tourism industry can not only return to reopening, but to a safer and better standard than before. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy, and I apologize for mispronouncing your last name as well. Hey, everybody does it. <laughs> um, next, we have Lionel Hamanaka, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, followed by Barry Falk and Lisa Martinez. Um, Lionel, you may after the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Thank you, Chairs Cohen and Rodriguez, Council Members Callas, Reynoso, Salamanca, and Council Members. I'm Leonel Hamanaka, District 6, a tour guide, and I support wholeheartedly your outdoor dining legislation that's been so successful. Why? Because New York is the center piece of dining in the United States based on our great diversity. Everybody in the world comes here. Uh, in regard to commissioner's uh, point of street safety, I read yeah. that since June 2020, four accidents with cars and one van crashed into eight outdoor diners in all parts of the city. Cars weigh 1.3 tons, double-decker buses weigh 13 tons, and their past accidents uh, have resulted in up to 12 or 13 people getting killed or injured. Um, even one plaintiff, Devin Cipher, struck by a bus, a double-decker with no licensed person on top, won an $85 million lawsuit in 2018. No legislation in New York requires bus owners to report accidents uh, to oversight agencies. Hence, statistical studies are impossible. Um, bus drivers on double-deckers are forced to be distracted drivers because of multitasking, selling tickets, which requires them to take their hands off the wheel, punching recorded tours uh, and answering questions and trying to see upstairs, which is impossible because of blind spots. So in light of this, and uh, in sequential to your great legislation on outdoor dining, uh, please look at 289A. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to now call on uh, Barry or Barry. Starting time. She needs to be unmuted. Barry. All right, I think good. Hi, uh, my name is Barry Fall. 
And um, I live in District 25, uh, Jackson Heights. I'm a tour guide, also uh, working on uh, uh, open top uh, buses, licensed uh, New York City sightseeing guide. So uh, you know, as our city is opening up and tourists begin to return, uh, we need to make certain everyone remains safe, uh, tourists and locals alike. Uh, tour guides have an important role to play in that. And I'm very excited about the uh, open streets and the outdoor dining. It really is bringing New York City uh, back to life at uh, this difficult time. And you know, I feel that it will help uh, save the restaurant industry and also promote tourism because it kind of makes it exciting to be here, right? Um, now, uh, at the same time, open top buses have uh, already uh, started operating. And at this point, they're not using a uh, tour guide up on top, which of course presents uh, quite a risk. Uh, guides are now uh, more necessary actually than ever uh, before. Uh, I worked as a guide uh, for three years. I have an in-depth understanding of the role or our role uh, when it comes to maintaining safety. Uh, guides make repeated safety announcements uh, so that guests remain seated, uh, take care of their children because uh, if we're not there, sometimes they'll have their children running up and down the aisles. I'm not kidding. And uh, just make sure that they don't move around uh, the bus. So um, nevertheless, uh, you know, even though we make those announcements, uh, you know, sometimes we have to move really quickly to save somebody from, you know, a head injury, for instance, or a slip and fall. Uh, we must also make certain that they don't distract the driver. You know, sometimes they miss their stop and they go running down the stairs in a panic, <laughs> you know, and you don't want to distract a driver, especially now with um, with the outdoor dining. It just uh, makes everything a lot more dangerous. So uh, they need to be focused on uh, their driving, navigating uh, through New York City. Time expired. Street. Okay. Um, it's also important that uh, we're there to make certain that guests adhere to social distancing and mask wearing uh, mandates, and so that they uh, help keep the virus. Thank, from you, thank you for your testimony. All right. Um, can you please support uh, Bill? Uh, 289A, uh, so that everybody is safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Lisa Martinez, followed by Tom Proctor, Rosamond, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, Gianotos, Gianotos, sorry about that. Um, Lisa, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Hi, my name is Liza Martinez. I am a member of Families for Safe Streets. In January, I stood before some of you in person uh, with Chairperson Rodriguez and shared the story of my beloved mother, Ada Martinez. Three days ago, our family marked the one year since my dear, beautiful mother, healthy mother, was killed. She was the 177th New Yorker to be killed in a traffic crash in 2019. She was the 27th cyclist killed last year. I talk about her at the last he hearing, but I want everyone to know about my mom and the price for not acting and taking action. Ada was an amazing devoted mother to three of us, a proud grandmother to our seven kids, seven grandchildren, a loving wife, and a dear friend to many. She was our family matriarch to our family and was secure with her at her home. She was a connector and brought everyone together, and she loved spending time with, on the boardwalk near my parents' homes in Rockaway where she was killed. My mother was a 66-year-old woman and had the vibrancy of someone of 26. She brought life and positivity to everyone around her, and she was a community leader and a force. She moved to New York from Puerto Rico and together with my dad started a family business, a hardware store in bed and then became landlords and had a uh, tenant for a cafe that was then since closed since the coronavirus back in January. And with these businesses put me through business school, so I'm all about the numbers and I understand that perspective of everything here. My beautiful mother, Ada Martinez, inspires me and gives me the courage to be here today, but I'm here today for you, for you and your family, and that you'll never have to stand here to speak about your own mother or spouse or child or friend, because this is a nightmare that we live every single day. 10 months ago, I begged for action, but for 10 months, redesigning streets to save life was an uphill battle if I if it meant a few parking spots were taken away. I am a New Yorker and like my mom, I like to tell it as it is. It is crazy that the city can act fast when business is at stake. Trust me, I know the importance of business because my mom and dad ran a family I'm business expired. for 40 years. Okay, I, um, it is 
a little hypocritical that these life changing uh, changes are easy to make for commercial reasons, but not to protect New Yorkers like my mom. She deserved better. And I ask now that you really think hard about the legacy of your own position here and the legacy of New Yorkers, because although New Yorkers are a gem, just like my mother, we're not perfect. And we need to make sure that we see our floors before celebrating all this dining and all this money that we want to generate, which I'm all for. But I urge you as you contemplate your own legacy that you remember my mother and your families and keep that in mind for the safety of New Yorkers. Thank you so much for all your time and all your hard work. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Liza. And sorry for your loss. Next, we have Dr. Followed by Rosamond Gianatison and then Allison Raygor. Um, Tom, you may begin your testimony after uh, the sergeant calls time. Starting time. My name is Thomas Proctor. I'm a Bronx resident in Council Member Salamanca's district, and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets. Uh, I want to thank Chairs Rodriguez and Cohen and the members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. Uh, when the lockdown started, I was worried about the rampant speeding that I saw throughout our city. But I never expected tragedy to strike me. However, in May, my brother Charlie was killed by a reckless driver near his home in Boston when he was out riding his bike with his girlfriend. He was just two weeks before his 28th birthday. They had just signed a lease to move in together. Instead, he died in his arm, in her arms. In his 28 years, Charlie did more than most do in a lifetime. He spent his final birthday on Mount Denali, climbing the Casson Ridge. He was always pushing us to push our own limits and exit our comfort zone. I speak to you now on the way to a memorial in the mountains he loved, to grieve with those he inspired, to contemplate how we can live a life deserving of his memory without him. The intersection where he was killed had been identified by the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization as a particularly dangerous intersection in dire need of repair. Local leaders have the opportunity to prevent my brother's death. They ignored the problem and they did nothing. The problem of deadly tra traffic crashes is particularly severe in the United States and New York is no exception. As we reopen, New Yorkers are avoiding the subway and will be walking and biking on our streets more than ever. If we do nothing, these deaths will only increase further. You have shown that New York City can act quickly to transform our streets when there is a commercial need. I urge you to build a true network of open streets while we recover from the pandemic to protect our brothers, our sisters, our parents, children, and friends before it's too late. You have the opportunity to fix New York streets and to prevent death like my brothers. Please do not ignore this problem. Please do not do nothing. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, and I'm very sorry for the loss of your brother. Thank you. Next we have Rosamond, followed by Allison, followed by Marco. Uh, well, Keys, does C Council Member Rodriguez oh. have a question? I apologize. Sorry, Council Member. Uh, Chair Rodriguez, you may begin. Yeah, it's very brief. More than a question is, as you have expressed our solidarity to those laws, and as I know the uh, Council Member Chair Cohen and all of us, uh, it will continue doing our work to make our streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Rosamond, you may begin your testimony um, after the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, uh, particularly for your efforts to make the streets safer for all of us. My name is Dr. Rosamond Giannuzos. I'm a specialist in neuropsychological rehabilitation and have treated numerous individuals whose lives have been devastated by traffic violence. I strongly support the mission of Families for Safe Streets. But today I come before you also as a longtime resident of Sunnyside, Queens, from my council member Van Bramer's district, and am an active supporter of the 39th Avenue Open Streets Coalition. My neighbors and I have been working with the DOT 
as local partners to promote and maintain our 39th Avenue open street, which runs for 10 blocks. It is a narrow two-way corridor with bicycle sharrows and parked cars all on both sides of the travel lanes. It has evolved into a cut through for cars heading into and out of the city. I have to hold my grandchildren's hands tight as I negotiate crossing on 52nd Street and 39th Ave where I live. At least that was particularly so prior to the open streets. Now there are some barriers, so I've got a, um, a place where I can pause as I cross. Prior to that, the open street on 39th Ave, I was knocked from my bicycle to the pavement of 39th Avenue twice by cars. In one instance, I was hit by a T-boned by an NYPD patrol vehicle making an illegal U-turn in front of a double parked car. And I can still see the wheel of that police car inches above my knee. With proper traffic I'm calm improvements, these kinds of incidents wouldn't happen. We need to make changes and make these changes. We are, are acting quickly to make changes for businesses, for restaurants. I'm supportive of that, but we need to be equally expeditious when it comes to making the roadways safe for everybody, um, especially pedestrians and bicyclists. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have Allison Raycor, followed by Mark O'Connor, followed by David Bogaski. Allison, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Starting. Hello, my name is Allison Raycor, and I'm a member of Family for Safe Streets. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about that day is the weather. It was a quintessentially perfect fall day. Bright skies, crisp air, warm breeze, much like today. My boyfriend and I had spent time that morning on a bench in Williamsburg overlooking the East River, grateful for the time together in such an idyllic setting. He went to work and I went upstairs to his apartment to make my birthday guest list, emailing it to him before packing up my bike basket and throwing on a tote bag, one strap on each shoulder. And off I rode to my own apartment in bed -Stuy, a route I'd taken hundreds of times before. It was a few blocks after I'd left the protected bike lane on Kent Avenue, heading south, that I stopped at a light near a large vehicle about the size of a garbage truck. The truck turned right, the force of it pushing me to the ground, and before I knew it, I was underneath it. I only really registered that I was in trouble when I tried to roll out from under the truck and realized the tote bag was pinned under the truck's wheel. And with the straps over my shoulders, I too was pinned. In what felt like much longer, but was of course only a split second, I realized that if the tote bag was under the tire, then my own head would be next. But thankfully, because it was such a beautiful day, the driver's windows were down and he could hear me screaming. So he stopped. <clears throat> Since that day, I've often asked myself a series of what if questions. What if I had left the apartment a few minutes later? What if the driver had taken a different route? What if it had been cold that day or raining and the driver hadn't heard my screams? And what if that bike lane, protecting me from traffic by a concrete barrier, had extended just a few blocks more, getting me even closer to home? Thank you for making open streets a priority during the pandemic. It has been amazing to watch how the city can prioritize people. With Time cars. expired. With the open dining program, the DOT has repurposed car parking lanes for open dining, which is great. But why were they not able to reconsider parking spots to make it possible for me to make a protected bike lane my entire trip? It is truly infuriating to witness how quickly the DOT can act to help restaurants survive when every change Families for Safe Streets fights for takes so long. The hypocrisy of doing it only for commercial reasons and not for the purpose of safe streets, an aspect of public health, is infuriating and unacceptable. I'm not here to ask the city council to predict the weather, but I am here to illustrate what can happen when cyclist safety is not prioritized on New York City streets. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. 
Next we have Marco, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Marco, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Cohen, uh, Chair Rodriguez, and council members for your work. My name is Marco Conadiaqua. I am Deputy Director with Transportation Alternatives here in New York City. Um, just as we can design for open dining, we can also design for safe streets. Uh, first, Transportation Alternatives strongly supports open dining. This overdue repurposing of space helps create dynamic streets worthy of a city like ours and have been uh, lifesavers for our restaurants. At the same time, it has become clear that we need a paradigm shift for a successful recovery from COVID-19. Today, we are facing Carmageddon. Once we reopen fully, we can expect traffic congestion even worse than before the pandemic. Transit use is down, even though many still prefer buses, while biking volumes and sales are exploding. We urge the council and the mayor to truly and equitably reimagine our streets and to keep public space public. Some tremendously successful open streets have been implemented during this crisis and show just how wonderful and calm yet dynamic our street space can become literally overnight. When we repurpose a car travel lane for a protected bike lane, a bus lane or expanded pedestrian space like open streets and open dining, it not only benefits businesses with increased retail sales connecting New York to job shopping and educational opportunities, it also saves lives by making that street safer for all street users, including drivers themselves. So with this in mind, we need to acknowledge that some open dining right now is over blocking bike lanes bus lanes and narrow sidewalks. These are not reasons to abandon open dining. They are red flags that we need to address immediately in order to improve open dining to the benefit of all New Yorkers. We urge uh, the city to view open restaurant dining in conjunction with open streets. Turning a street into an open street immediately removes many of the challenges we currently experience with open dining competing- I'm expired. Uses of the streets. Uh, now, finish up uh, quickly. Um, we need to fully fund and implement the streets master plan, the green wave plan, and the dangerous vehicle abatement program. Um, finally, I want to highlight the speed by which this reclamation of space has happened in the open dining program. I want to contrast that to the reluctance and outright opposition by a small but vocal minority of New Yorkers, including legislators, to do the same to simply save lives. We need to decide whether saving a life is at least as important as saving jobs and restaurants. If the answer is that people's lives are at least as important, then the mayor and council must act accordingly. We can have both, but only if jobs, restaurants, and people's lives are truly valued by this council and by Mayor de Blasio. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> Next, we'd like to call on Tawaki Kamatsu. And at, he, this is our final witness. Um, at this time, if your name hasn't been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you after, um, after Mr. Kamatsu. Um, Tawaki Kamatsu, you may begin your testimony after the Sergeant has called time. Starting time. Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. In the case of Gonzalez versus City of New York, it's assigned to a federal judge that's assigned to a federal lawsuit that I have, uh, Judge Schofield. She stated in that decision, consistent with the traditionally open character of public streets and sidewalks, we have held that the government's ability to restrict speech in such locations is very limited. This hearing is about using a fraudulent pretext to violate both New York City Administrative Code 16122B and the sacrosanct First Amendment rights of New Yorkers on public sidewalks that are traditional public forums on which to exercise those rights without an objectively valid justification to bail out restaurants by letting people pig out and get drunk on sidewalks while keeping them as an illegal and unsafe obstacle course for the blind parents with baby strollers and people in wheelchairs and using crutches while having to dodge NYPD Nazis and terrorists on that that appear on them as a plague that puts the coronavirus to shame without an RSVP in Greenwich Village and elsewhere in New York City where that trash doesn't belong, just like Bill de Blasio and whistleblower news censors in journalism. Um, and many more that facilitate such ter terrorism by their silence 
nearly eight, four years and eight months after this council approved a 32% pay raise for its gang that it was that it was told then it didn't deserve and uh, it is now being reminded that it still doesn't deserve while the public may be wondering when it will grow tired of sitting on its hands in response to requests for necessary and urgently needed reforms. I will promptly make certain that no further restrictions are imposed on the rights of New Yorkers to exercise their First Amendment rights on all areas of public sidewalks whenever they so choose. While doing so, I will similarly arrange for all, all, for all obstructions that exist on sidewalks that impede the abilities of New Yorkers to exercise those rights to be removed. The way that I'll do that is by filing a legal brief in my federal lawsuit within the next two days. Um, in the meantime, have a good day. Time expired. Thank you. As I see there are no hands raised, um, I'd like to turn it over to the chairs for final remarks. Councilmember Rodriguez, Chair Rodriguez, do you have anything you'd like to say before we close? Something brief related to transportation that I know is important for you and for me. And, and as we are addressing how to make the city safer for everyone, for those who use the restaurant, but also for cyclists and pedestrians. And, and, and again, this is not directly connected with the topic, but it's about the safety of cyclists. As you know, many of the cyclists that you have in Riverdale and those who also uh, live from, go from North Manhattan to Riverdale, they pass uh, through the 225 bridge. And I think that it is important uh, and I highlighted to both uh, the, the Manhattan DOT Commission and the Park Commission, the importance to improve the cycling, the bicycle path that we have in the bridge in the Inwood Park. Uh, so that we can make it easier for cyclists that they come from Riverdale or that they go from Manhattan to Riverdale, that when they go through the Inwood Park to improve the cyclists, the, the bicycle path that we have there. So this is important highlighting to you know, both and hopefully you know, we can have a walk around there and see how we can join forces to improve the safety in that area for, for cyclists. Uh, it is my understanding that as part of a reconstruction of that bridge, there's going to be a protected bike lane on that bridge. Um, yeah. I it's, do want to. It's not a 225th. This is inside the Inwood Park. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank uh, Chair Rodriguez for his partnership. I really want to thank all the council staff. Uh, it's an enormous amount of work to put together these uh, Zoom hearings, uh, organization, and technical uh, work. Uh, and the preparation. So I, again, uh, I know I thanked uh, the committee council uh, and our analyst in, in my opening, but uh, again, uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, also again to the Sergeant at Arms uh, for, uh, for all your work in making sure that these hearings proceed orderly. Uh, and with that, this concludes this uh, joint committee meeting of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Committee on Transportation.